See, by starting early, I'm trying to train the Pinesters to always be on call. <laughs> Onward, Pinester soldiers, ready for war. Um, I usually never start late, though, but welcome. Uh, yes, Michael, RCH, you are first. Is this your first time being first? And unlike the New Testament, here at the Pine Creek Channel, first is first, not last is first. Uh, welcome, Camille. He's in an undisclosed location in Eastern Europe, as always. <clears throat> He's so knowledgeable and powerful that we have to keep his location hidden. <laughs> but you can uh, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, there you go. Hi. Hi. So, um, Blake... Uh, may or may not show up later. I think he's uh, going to be watching this, um, and so it's up to him. He's welcome to hop in at any time. But uh, I think what we'll do here is we'll start with... Um, you wrote, a, what, a, like a two, three, four-page paper on a natural explanation or a summary that you sent to Blake a while back on... Um, how would you phrase it? A natural explanation for the evidence of the resurrection or something like that? Well, actually, one of the things that I'm granting is that Yahweh exists specifically, not just any God, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, no, I mean, it's just after our last discussion, Blake asked me to write something down. So he knows what he's dealing with. So I just did. And I thought we are going to talk about it because I've watched like dozens of resurrection debates, probably over 100 hours, and I'm really irritated how poorly atheists are doing. Specifically, they don't present usually any alternative, and they just poke holes in the resurrection hypothesis and they raise doubt. And I think we can do much better. And if we take it seriously, we can come up with uh, an explanation, actually a lot of explanations, yeah. which I think are much more probable. So I just uh, thought about it for a while and write something out. Okay, well, do you want to get started with that? Yeah, sure. It's, it's going to take about five minutes to go through that, uh, and then we can try to poke some holes in it. Sure. So as I said, I'm granting for the sake of argument that Yahweh exists. I'm granting that miracles happen, including resurrections. I'm granting there are five independent sources for the resurrection. So the pre-Pauline creeds, the speeches that are preserved in Acts, the letters of Paul, the synoptics and Acts, and then finally the Gospel of John. And I'm right, uh, granting that the Gospels are written in a genre of Greco-Roman historical biographies. Um, I think that the resurrection hypothesis explains the evidence, but it has a very low prior probability, even if Yahweh exists and miracles do happen, because we observe that Yahweh has a very strong tendency not to raise people from the dead, and it's very improbable he would make an exception with Jesus, because all of the arguments for thinking that he did are either ad hoc, uh, they are circular, or the conclusion doesn't actually follow. Uh, so my alternative is what I call the Old Testament hypothesis, and it just says that early Christians believed the Old Testament to be a historically reliable source, source of information about Jesus, and they mistook their religious experiences for confirmations of this belief. And what I mean by this is that early Christians obviously believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and they also believed that the Old Testament describes what the Messiah will do. So naturally, they believed that this is what Jesus already did. And as we all know, the Old Testament clearly says that the Messiah will suffer for sins of others. He will be humiliated and killed. And then after his death, he will be raised, lifted up and highly exalted in heaven. Uh, so early Christians believe all of that actually happened to Jesus and that he's right now sitting in heaven next to God's celestial throne on his right hand side, even though that's not actually true. And also importantly, early Christians were second temple Jews. So they believed in bodily resurrections. So they would believe that Jesus was raised not spiritually, but he was actually raised in a body that you can see and touch. And later they had some religious experiences that they mistook as confirmations that this is what actually happened. 
So how does it explain the evidence? Let's start with the empty tomb. So we know that Isaiah clearly says uh, they made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. So uh, the gospel authors mistakenly believe that Isaiah is talking about Jesus. So they believe that this is what actually happened to Jesus, that he was buried with the rich. So when they wrote the gospels, they included a story about Jesus's burial in rich man's grave, which is consistent with their source, that's Isaiah. And they added some details based on their existing beliefs. So for example, they believe that Jesus was raised bodily, which means that if he was placed in rich man's grave, the grave would become empty because Jesus would just walk away, right? Because he was raised in his body. Uh, and I think this is very, the prob prior probability is very high because of uh, what's called the literary devices theory, championed by scholars such as Mike Lacona or Craig, Craig Keener. Uh, it says that we know uh, authors of Greco-Roman biographies invented details to create their narratives. And we actually know that Jewish historians did the same thing. And these uh, Christian apologists actually list a number of things that they think didn't happen in history, but they are recorded in the Gospels. And this doesn't mean that the Gospel authors were lying or being deceptive. It just means that this was acceptable in the genre of Greco-Roman biography. Because, for example, they think that uh, Gospel of John moves the day when Jesus was crucified for a theological reason. Uh, they invent some of the details of the resurrection appearances. Uh, they, for example, move the cleansing of the temple and they invent some things that didn't happen in history, like uh, the resurrection of the saints in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and we know that believers in many religions routinely read their own circumstances into existing religious texts. Just think of all the Christians today who believe that Barack Obama is the Antichrist because they think that some events in his life match the prophecies about the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. Uh, so we can see that the parallels between the person and the scripture doesn't have to be very strong even uh, in order for believers to be truly convinced that this is a religious text that talks about them and their own times. So I'm proposing this is something that happens to early Christians as well. Uh, then we have appearances. Uh, when it comes to appearances of the Gospels, uh, I think there are stories created by the Gospel authors as a combination of their existing beliefs, specifically the belief in the uh, bodily res resurrection of Jesus and what their sources told them. So they heard that the disciples had some experiences which they interpreted as uh, seeing a risen Jesus. So they just wrote the stories uh, depicting Jesus being raised bodily and appearing to the disciples. And the reason why the stories are different is because different authors just invented different stories. That's why Jesus eats a piece of fish in the Gospel of Luke. And that's why Thomas gets to poke his wound in the Gospel of John. Uh, then we have appearances in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, and my hypo hypothesis just says that early Christians mistook their religious experiences for a confirmation of their existing belief uh, that Jesus was raised. And there is a number of uh, purely natural phenomena that can explain this. And what's important is that these phenomena are external, which means do they ex exist outside people's minds. You don't have to appeal to things like group hallucinations. And I'm just picking one ex hypothesis, and I'm claiming that one day a large group of early Christians was walking outside when suddenly they saw a Jesus-shaped cloud. Uh, Cephas saw it first, then the 12th, then more than 500 brethren saw it at the same time, then James saw it, and then finally all the apostles saw it. And this uh, appearance for them was a confirmation of what they already believe, believed, uh, specifically that Jesus was raised and is now highly exalted in heaven. And again, I think the prior probability of this is very high. Just think of all the Christians who had their existing belief in the divinity of Jesus sincerely strengthened just by seeing the face of Jesus in a piece of toast. 
It may sound very silly to us because we are rational post enlightenment rationalistic people, uh, but it's actually very common today around the world. And it was very common in antiquity. There are entire churches built around the face of Jesus on a rock, for example. I found one instance where the bodies had to actually be called to prevent a stampede of Christians flocking to a site where a face of Jesus appeared uh, on a uh, rock. Uh, and we know that this was even common in Second Temple Juda uh, Judaism. In Acts, Peter quotes Old Testament prophet Joel, who mentions signs of the end times. And it includes things like seeing the blood moon, which we, of course, know as a pure and natural phenomenon. Uh, then we have a conversion of Paul, uh, which I'm just going to explain as a guilt-induced uh, uh, delusion. And I'm going to appeal to Mike Lacona, who said that if there was only one guy who hallucinated, then the hallucination hypothesis would be more probable than the resurrection. So in my explanation, there is just one guy who hallucinated, so it's more probable than the resurrection. Uh, and then everything else, like the martyrdom of the apostles, the spread of Christianity, can be explained equally well by a sincere but false belief in the resurrection uh, as it is by a true belief. Uh, so just to sum it up, I think my Old Testament hypothesis explain, explains all of the evidence at least equally well. But because it has a much higher probability, it's more reasonable than the resurrection hypothesis. And it has a higher bioprobability because it's built on a widespread and very well-documented features on hum of human psychology and of ancient literary conventions of Greco-Roman biographies. Thank you. Okay, um, let's start with 1 Corinthians 15. So your explanation of, uh, actually, should I bring that up, the creed? Because that's this is probably the... Sure. What something Blake would say, right? This is probably yeah, exactly. Where and I, I'm is... by the way, I'm granting that the creed comes uh, goes back to the Jerusalem pillars. So I'm granting that Peter himself told the early Christians, including Paul, that this is what happened to us. This is our creed, uh, and okay. they were willing to defend it uh, to their death. Okay, so you're granting that this creed was floating around very early on and mm -hmm. uh, and that they truly believed it and they were willing to die for it. But the difference is you would say, okay, uh, let's read it. Um, now I remind you, brethren, in what terms I preached to you the gospel which you received, which, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures that he was buried and that he raised he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures that he appeared to cephas then the 12 then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep okay let's stop there so you what i heard you say is on your hypothesis you're saying that that actually did happen that 500 people at one time uh saw jesus but you're saying it was in the form of a cloud? Well, imagine, like, let, let me give you an analogy. Imagine that you read a, a UFO magazine written by someone who believes in alien abductions, who says, yesterday, more than uh, an alien spacecraft appeared to more than 500 people. It would use the same language, the language of seeing, of sight, but what actually happened is that it was planet Venus and the people, because they already believe in alien abductions and they believe that alien spacecraft, when they appear on the sky, look something like that, concluded that what they are actually seeing is an alien spacecraft. So it's not required for them to see an actual spaceship. It's not required for them to touch it or be taken into it. The existing belief that there are aliens abducting people is sufficient for them to conclude that what they are seeing is a spacecraft, even though they are actually seeing a pure natural phenomena. And what I'm saying is that we know that people in antiquity, and actually even people today, uh, interpreted purely natural atmospheric phenomena like the blood moon for example as indications of the divine will so it's not improbable to believe that they would have their already existing belief in the resurrection and exaltation of jesus confirmed 
uh, by something like that. But here's the kicker, and Paul says that most of whom are still alive. So Paul's uh, intimating here that, look, if you doubt this, if you don't believe this, you can go find these people and talk to them uh, yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, if they did, these people would tell them, yeah, we saw the risen Jesus. Just like, like, imagine if you go to a UFO conference and actually like look there, a lot of people who believe in alien abductions meet and they talk about their experiences, right? They all obviously believe that there are aliens abducting people. And because there actually aren't, their experiences are going to be contradictory. Like some people think that they are reptilians. Some people think that they are great aliens. Some people saw Venus. Some people saw a, a magnetic storm or something like that. But the point is that even if at the conference they discover that their experiences are contradictory, they are very unlikely to to conclude that aliens are not actually visiting Earth, right? We know that contradictions in these kinds of experiences, or even non sequiturs in these kinds of experiences, don't actually deconvert people from these kinds of beliefs. That's why there are Muslims, Mormons, you know, uh, people belonging to religions that are very easily debunkable. But there are no contradictions. There are no like as as we read on in the gospels and so forth there's a consistent story of of Jesus appearing eating supping walking for 40 days in acts uh how would you explain that do you mean the the appearances in the gospels yeah the appearances in the gospels after the resurrection and also in acts yeah i think i think it's very important like not to import uh, what the gospels say about about the appearances back into first corinthians right because that would be kind of question begging uh, and i and i and i've just as i've just said uh the appearances in the gospels on my hypothesis are uh, stories created by authors of greco-roman biographies who believe that uh because for example they heard some creeds that Jesus appeared to the earliest disciples and they believe that Jesus was raised bodily because that was a standard second temple Jewish belief. So when they wrote the story about what happened after the resurrection during the appearances, they just did what authors of Greco-Roman historical biographies did and they wrote a plausible story. Who's in they? Some details. The gospel authors. But these gospel authors are the people who actually saw Jesus with their own eyes, at least with Matthew and John, right? Well, uh, that uh, might not necessarily be the... Yeah, I mean, that could be the case. But even if they are uh, themselves eyewitnesses, I'm wondering to what degree this would uh, be a hindrance to my hypothesis, because there is a number of New Testament scholars who still affirm traditional authorship, but they nevertheless subscribe to the literary devices theory and say that uh, the uh, gospel authors had no problem to alter their narrative because that's what uh, authors of Greco-Roman historical biographies did, uh, and they would do it for theological reasons. So like, uh, Michael Acuna, for example, says that there is a narrative elasticity in the Gospels. He thinks that uh, John, who he thinks was a, a, an eyewitness, altered the day of the crucifixion. He believes that the resurrected saint signs in Matthew might be apocalyptic imagery. Craig Keener, who thinks that the Gospel of John was written by John and the Gospel of Matthew was written by Matthew, thinks that uh, John moved the cleansing of the temple for theological reasons. He believes that Matthew duplicated a healing of two men. He believes that Matthew duplicated blind men within the healing story and also the demoniacs healed in Matthew 8. And here's the kicker. He believes that John, who was an eyewitness, actually invented uh, at least partially the resurrection appearance, specifically Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit into his disciples. So I'm wondering, there are very conservative evangelical scholars who believe that the gospels were written by eyewitnesses, but because they are good historians and they realize that this was common in Greco-Roman biography, they don't see any problem with that. Are, is Craig Keener saying that, that the disciple John wrote the Gospel mm -hmm. of John, lied? Uh, no, uh, that this is very important to realize. So uh, 
when we think about what kind of literary practice would be deceptive, we have to understand what was acceptable given the genre. And this is true today. Like there was a, there was an, uh, a performance of Julius Caesar recently where, by Shakespeare, where Julius Caesar was depicted as Donald Trump. And everyone understands that that doesn't mean that the director is lying. Uh, because Julius Caesar didn't look like Donald Trump. Like everyone understands that within the genre of drama, uh, there are some literary conventions that are implicitly acceptable. And one of them is that you can bend the story, you can adapt it to, for example, give a political message. And this is true about Greco-Roman biographies. So if, for example, John invented a detail in one of the resurrection appearances that didn't actually happen in history, this wouldn't be lying and it wouldn't be deceptive. And actually his audience would understand that this is what he's doing because it was just very common and accepted literary practice. And I can even give you examples of uh, Greek, Roman, and Jewish historians who do that outside the context of the Bible, uh, very close to the events that they are describing, like within 20 years, even if there are still eyewitnesses around who could debunk the claim. Nobody did that because everyone understands that this is, understood that this is just uh, a part of the genre. Got it. Okay. So let's review here. Your theory is that the Jews, the first century Jews who became Christians had this idea in their head of a Messiah that would resurrect bodily. Mm -hmm. Can you defend that? Yeah. Was that common? What well, percentage of Jews would you think that applies to? Uh, I think very small. Uh, I think most Jews expected uh, the Messiah to be a victorious warrior, king, who would basically kick the Romans out of Palestine, and he would restore the Jewish kingdom. Uh, in the boundaries that uh, were there during the reign of Solomon, for example. Uh, and then he would just reign, either he would establish a new dynasty or he would just reign forever because right. he the was a Solomon. The pharisaical view. Uh, yeah, uh, but it's very important to realize that there was actually a massive plurality in ancient Jewish beliefs. So for example, it's not true that all Jews believe there is just one God. Uh, for example, uh, Philo of Alexandria believed that Logos is the second God. Uh, he speculated that Moses was an incarnation of a divine being. And as we all know, uh, John McClatchy recently said that we have evidence of the Jews before the time of Jesus sorry, who believed in a plurality of divine persons. Uh, the Jews, second temple Jews couldn't even agree if there's going to be a resurrection or not. Pharisees uh, believed the resurrection, but Sadducees actually thought that there is no resurrection. And we have a debate between them recorded in Acts, for example, when Paul stirs up the, an argument between Pharisees and Sadducees about the resurrection in Acts. So it's not at all implausible if you have millions of millions of Jews throughout hundreds and hundreds of years, that a small sect would come up with a very new... How um, small? What's your guess on how small of a sect this was? 12 people. <laughs> Oh, really? Initially, yeah. Sure, why not? Uh, it, it doesn't have to be like exactly 12, right? It could be it's right, very small. Right. But the point is, like, yes, it's true that the idea that the Messiah is going to be humiliated and killed, uh, that wasn't very widely believed. Uh, but you can say the same thing about the golden plates, right? Like there isn't any other religion that was founded around uh, the golden plates. And actually the idea that there were Jews, specifically Jews living in America who left behind golden plates actually predates uh, Mormonism. It's just uh, there isn't any other religion that's based on that. Because if anyone did that, after Mormonism, it would be obvious they are just ripping off Joseph Smith. And the reason why nobody did it before Joseph Smith is be because, like with anything, there's always someone who does it first, right? So the same is true, is true about uh, Jesus. But I'm going to defend that you can get the entire New Testament theology just out of the Old Testament. Are there any... Uh, does Lycona believe this? That Jesus was not raised? I don't think so. No, 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 no. That you can get the idea of a small, very small sect of Judaism who believed that the Messiah would resurrect bodily. Well, we would have to ask him. But he uh, said a couple of things. Um, 
but I would have to look it up. Like, for example, he says that the idea that the Messiah and the Son of Man are identical is already attested in pre-Christian Jewish thought, which I agree, this is probably true. And if that's the case, this is a very key component of New Testament theology that Christians didn't actually have to invent. They just inherited inherited it from some other uh, second Christian, uh, second temple Jews who came up with it first. And it's, it's very important because if you identify the Son of Man with the Messiah, then that means that the Messiah becomes the celestial being who's going to come at right before the end of the uh, of the uh, before the end of the age, and then he's going to be very highly exalted in the presence of God. Like one of the most exotic language in the Old Testament is the language that the Book of Daniel uses about the Son of Man. So if you make this connection between the Messiah and the Son of Man, you have a massive piece in the puzzle. Then you have to connect these two with the suffering uh, servant in the Messiah. And you basically have a complete picture of Jesus who dies for the sins of others, then he's raised, then he's highly exalted in heaven. That's exactly what the New Testament says happened to Jesus. Okay, I want to keep this very simple. So you're saying that the natural explanation for the data we see is this. There was a very, very tiny sect of Judaism that Jesus himself could have been a part of walking around 2,000 years ago. Then this Jesus guy dies. And his, the other people within the sect are sad, uh, depressed, weren't expecting this, or were expecting this? Well, it depends, right? It depends how seriously you take the, the, the uh, portrayal of the disciples in the Gospels. Like, if you buy the Gospels and you think the disciples were basically dumb, who didn't, they didn't understand ever anything, well, then my hypothesis would be that they just figured it out after Jesus died because they thought, this, this can't be happening. There must be a reason for this. So they went back to the Septuagint and they read through it. And then they realized that this was actually a part of God's plan all along. Because it says in the Daniel that the Messiah is going to be killed. So it's if you read that and you have been following a guy who claimed to be a Messiah and then he was killed, makes you think, what's the point, right? So you start going through the scriptures. You already believe that this Messiah is the son of man. He's highly exalted. Who else is highly exalted? The suffering servant. What's happening with the suffering servant? He's being tortured and killed for the sake of others. That's the reason, right? But if you don't actually buy the description of the disciples in the Gospels, it's entirely possible that they already believed that this is going to happen and they were expecting it before Jesus was killed. And actually, Jesus might have been the one who figured this out. In which case, I'm completely open to the idea that Jesus predicted his own death because he already believed that he's the Messiah. He already believed that he's the apocalyptic son of man. He already believed that he's the suffering uh, servant. He believed that the prophet Isaiah was actually prophesying about him. So he knew just from reading the Old Testament that he's going to get crucified and then he's going to be raised, uh, lifted up and highly exalted. So he said that to his disciples, they believed it. That's how you get the religion started. What's your personal opinion? Do you think that the disciples were stupid and figured and just f figured that out after the fact, or that they kind of? I, th I think we can't know uh, honestly because uh, the de I think the depiction of the disciples in the Gospels as being extremely dumb is like either polemical, meaning it's the attack against the disciples, or it fits the literary trope of reversal of expectation. So the people who are closest to Jesus are the ones that actually don't get him. They get him the least. And we see this uh, reversal of expectation repeated many times. So it would be actually unlikely if this was the one thing that happened in history. So it could be either. It, it can actually be, there is a third option, that someone figured it out even before Jesus was born, and Jesus just adopted it. And the difference is that he, for some reason, became convinced that he's the Messiah, right? And I th don't think we will ever know which one, uh, oh, which one of these three options. So before Jesus, during Jesus' time, or after Jesus' death is true, because there is no evidence, one way or the other. Yeah, and there could have been, I think a lot of Christians even admit this, that there could have been many people who believed this, uh, that they were the Messiah and that they would die and maybe even rise. 
Like... Yeah, that, that's a, that's actually a very good question because we know a lot of people who probably claim to be a messiah around the same time because they are recorded, for example, by Josephus. But we don't actually have any gospels written about them. Like imagine if we had four gospels about the Egyptian who was one of the Jewish religious leaders around the time. What would it say? Would it say that he believed he claimed to be the son of man? Would it say that he will, he claimed to be the suffering servant from Isaiah? We have no idea because his movement died out. The only guy who wrote about him is Josephus and then Luke. Um, and like imagine if all we had f about Jesus was the blurb uh, that's found in Josephus. We wouldn't know that he called himself the son of man because Josephus doesn't say that. Okay. I, again, I'm going to repeat this and, and make it so simple that my 13-year-old uh, my son could understand this. So you're saying the natural explanation for the evidence that we see, that Christians would say, hey, the resurrection explains this. You're saying, okay, there was a very tiny sect 2,000 years ago that believed that the Messiah would die and rise again. But you're not sure if that belief, this idea happened before Jesus, during Jesus, or after Jesus. But It's not, not that important. It's not yeah. that important. Okay, so, so we have the small sect. Um, Jesus dies. Um, then we have Paul come along, our earliest records. And Paul hears this creed of, from the, this small sect of, of Jews and repeats it in 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah, yeah. The t so that timeline is uh, Jesus dies. Right. Then at some point, the disciples be uh, became convinced that uh, he was raised bodily, highly exalted in heaven, uh, even though that's obviously not true. Um, it doesn't matter like uh, whether they became convinced of this after his death or before. Uh, they formulated. Th then they have this experience of seeing a Jesus-shaped cloud, which confirms like it seals the deal. They see uh, they see it, and aha, this is a, a confirmation sent to us by God that we are correct. Uh, they formulate the creed, Paul converts uh, and rep uh, reports the creed, and then later the gospel authors write the gospels, and because they are authors of Greco-Roman biographies, they produce the narratives that they do in line with their previous sources, mostly the Old Testament, and uh, based on their existing beliefs in bodily resurrections. Okay. And so I, I think a big part of this is that uh, the word appearance in 1 Corinthians 15, does that mean they actually saw Jesus like I'm seeing you right now? Or if it means... Yeah, I mean, that's that's a very impor important question, right? Like in, in Greek, the uh, verb is ofthe, which is a third person aorist uh, active indicative uh, plural of opto, uh, uh, sorry, orao, which means I see, I perceive, something like that. Uh, so that's obviously, it means like sight. Um, but I'm thinking of an analogy, like someone who believes in UFOs and alien abductions is much more likely to say, I saw an alien spacecraft, if all he actually saw was the planet Venus, for example. Because he already believes in alien spacecrafts, right? So he has a tendency to go to that conclusion. So um, what I'm saying is that when the, this sort of experience happened, whatever it might be, like the Jesus Shit Club is just one of many examples of the sorts of things that people believed it became convinced by in antiquity, uh, because they already believed that Jesus was raised, uh, ascended, and is highly exalted. Uh, I think it's very probable that based on that, they would say, yeah, we saw uh, Jesus appear to us. We saw Jesus. Well, I think it's more probable than a resurrection. <laughs> To be but, honest, even if it exists. Yeah, uh, well, I agree with you, but I think the Christian might say something like, um, okay, even if we put the Gospels aside for now, Camille, Paul's writing about this guy named Peter and a guy named James, and they're talking like they actually saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. Not that it's well, I mean, it, cloud or it, anything. It hang it hinges on one word, appear, right? Because if you put the Gospels aside and you don't import the, the appearances from the Gospels back into 1 Corinthians, it's just, it's, it's just one word. It doesn't say when it happened, where it happened. It doesn't say whether the groups and individuals in the creed, like uh, Cephas, the 500, all of the apostles, if these are 
distributed in time. So like on Monday, Cephas, on Friday, the 500. Like all we get, like for all we know, it happened like one after the other within 10 minutes, right? We don't know. Uh, so I'm just saying that this is something that I'm invoking X hypothesis. It can explain the evidence. And it's much more probable than an actual appearance, even if Yahweh exists, right? So why not this? Yeah, I, my uh, most people, I, I've said this before, but I went to a Pentecostal church for, what, two, three, four years? I forget the exact timeline. And I encourage Christians listening, if you've never been in a Pentecostal church, to go visit one. And uh, especially if you're a conservative Baptist type Christian, <laughs> go visit a Pentecostal church. And uh, or even just hang out outside after they're done. And when people come out, ask them if they experience Jesus. Or I think you'll even get some Pentecostals admit that Jesus appeared to them and will use the word appeared. And then ask and yourself. Probably, probably groups as well. Yeah. And then ask yourself as a as a good God fearing Bible believing Baptist Christian. Do you believe them? Do you believe that Jesus appeared to the, that group of Pentecostals? Because I tell you, Jesus does appear to Pentecostals at 11.15 a.m. every Sunday morning. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of joking, but sort of not. Um, if you've been to a Pentecostal church, Cam just to told Camille and I that he was at a Pentecostal church, um, was it last Sunday? And, and something like that happened. It's, it's like this, it's such an emotional experience that people really believe that they've seen Jesus or experienced Jesus or Jesus appeared to them, whether in their hearts or whatever. Okay, so, yeah, go ahead, Camille. Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, if, if there is a Christian denomination today, which is probably the closest to how the first Christians were, it's the Pentecostals. <laughs> I think it's, it's probably going to piss a lot of Christians off. But, like, the reason why there are denominations who handle snakes and speaking tongues and stuff like that is because that's in the New Testament, right? Uh, so I think they are much closer to the kind of experiences that early Christians had than, for example, the Catholics. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if I my second option, apart from a Jesus-shaped cloud, is... Uh, some kind of revival experience, like what Pentecostals will tell you they have. They even have uh, like a physical sensations, like Jesus touched me and stuff like that. Uh, the reason why I'm going with the Jesus Change Cloud is first, uh, just uh, here in Europe, there is a very strong uh, tradition, and in Latin America as well, of mostly Catholics uh, who have uh, um, the like appearances built around pure natural phenomena, like uh, saint, some saints or Mary or Jesus ship, uh, appearing in uh, a rock or in, on a wall or something like that. And people are really freaking out about that. It's not it, like it sounds silly to us, but there is a lot of people who are greatly impacted by that. And also because we know that in antiquity, people took this stuff seriously. Like there were divine signs. There was entire science about interpreting divine signs. And these divine signs were very often purely natural things like weather, right? Uh, there is a joke which is told by Plutarch about a guy who found out that a bag of wheat was uh, like a mice uh, ate through a bag of wheat. So he went to a priest and asked him, what should I do? And the priest said, okay, just fix the bag. And the point of the joke is to show that people really took even things like mice eating through a bag of wheat uh, as a divine sign, right? And this isn't just pagans like Greek and Romans. This is very well attested in the Old Testament. And we know that even Jews uh, did the same thing. After all, Acts talks about it. Okay. Small group, sect, a sect of uh, Jews, very, very small group, believed in the bodily resurrection of um, the Messiah. Yeah. Uh, they walk 2,000 years ago, they talk, they preach, the kingdom of God is coming, blah, blah, blah. Their leader dies, named Jesus. Shortly afterwards, they have an appearance that seals the deal. You're saying this could have been a, a, a cloud-shaped Jesus or whatever in the sky, Okay. Yeah, all a revival, or several over three weeks, something like that. Right, and that establishes yeah. the creed that Paul then learns and recites in 1 Corinthians 15. 
Okay, I can hear the Christian saying something like, um, okay, even if I were to buy this, even though what you just said, Camille, is absolutely stupid, even if I buy that for a second, how do you explain the Gospels? We now have a situation... Well, let me ask you this. When do you think the first Gospel was written? Well, I'm just wondering whether that's important, right? Because like, even if we grant that the traditional authors, the traditional authorship is correct, and they were written very early, uh, we have a lot of New Testament scholars who affirm the traditional authorship and are very con conservative, who are willing to say very interesting things about the kind of literary devices that the gospel authors used when they created th their narratives, like Craig Keener, a guy who wrote a massive book uh, where he tries to establish that miracles happen, has no, has no problem saying that some of the uh, post-resurrection appearances in the Gospel of John, who was written by John, an eyewitness to the events, is made up, which means that if we could take a camera and send it back to time, uh, back through time, it wouldn't be able to record what the Gospel of John says, right? So, like, is this really an issue? <laughs> yeah, but Keener doesn't say that about Matthew, does he? Like, how do you explain on a natural, naturalistic way what we read in Matthew that Jesus appeared to the women and so forth, and then to the men later? Yeah, I mean, like, my hot take is basically that the Gospel authors knew that there is this tradition of appearances, and they all obviously believed in a physical appearance. They believed that Jesus was buried in a rich man's grave, because that's what Isaiah says happened to Jesus. Isaiah because 53. as they believe, yep, yeah, they believe that uh, Isaiah is talking about Jesus. So everything that Isaiah says happened to Jesus. That's a reliable source of information. Uh, so they just wrote a plausible story. And I think the evidence that this is what happened is that four different people wrote four different stories like the reason why there are no no overlaps the reason why matthew who was supposed who is supposedly an eyewitness describes completely different appearances different location different groups of people than john who was also uh, supposedly an eyewitness is because if you have four different people who start roughly with the same uh, at the same starting point, the same sources of information and same beliefs. But they are not actual eyewitnesses to the events. They are going to come up with four different stories. Um, they are going to share the similarities because the sources are similar, but the details are going to be different. And this is exactly what we see in other Greco-Roman and Jewish biographies. So, Okay. Um, Blake, by the way, Blake is in the live stream chat now. I don't know how long he's been here. But um, I wanted to ask you, if you admit that it doesn't really matter when the Gospels are written, then I can hear the Christian saying, okay, I, I think your, your cloud-type hypothesis is absolutely stupid, but even if I was to buy it, and, it even if, and if you're admitting that Mark, or sorry, Matthew, was written very early, Mark doesn't have a resurrection scene, um, then if this was clearly wrong, there would be people alive to say, like, let's say Matthew was written in, in 60 or even 55, just, just shortly after Paul's letters. Th there would be people there to falsify it. How does your naturalistic explanation account for that? Yeah, exactly. So, so this is something that Craig Keener obviously has to answer as well. And the answer is that uh, people who would realize that this isn't what actually happened would also realize that the reason why the Gospels are reporting something that didn't actually happen is because they are written in the genre of Greco-Roman biographies and authors of Greco-Roman biographies had this narr narr narrative elasticity, right? It would be like today, uh, when someone went to see Julius uh, Caesar by Shakespeare, he found out that for some reason, Julius Caesar is depicted as Donald Trump, and he would get angry at the director for lying, being deceptive about how Julius Caesar probably looked like. Well, that wouldn't happen because everyone going to see the play, whether he likes it or not, would understand what drama is and what are the literary conventions of drama, right? So that wouldn't necessarily mean anything. Yeah, even if there were people who could debunk it, everyone would just point out that... Uh, this is completely normal. And again, I can provide a number of uh, similar situations when uh, 
Greco-Roman authors and Jewish authors write about events that very probably didn't happen uh, very shortly, say 20 years after they occurred. Uh, even if there are still eyewitnesses around, there are even historians who write uh, about topics completely outside the Bible, who say that the eyewitnesses wouldn't uh, feel the need to point out that the uh, history is not accurate, because everyone understood that the uh, there are some. There is some narrative elasticity when it comes to ancient but history. But is that true? Like, is it true that everyone understood that? Um, hey, this this is uh, an analogy. This is like you said, uh, Julius Caesar being Trump. Everybody understands it's you know that's not actually Trump or Julius Caesar was, ne was never Trump. Do you think people were smart enough back then to read Matthew? The people who just walked and talked in in Galilee, for example, that they would be smart enough to realize, oh, this is. This is a genre that, um, of course, when Matthew says that the women went to the tomb or, or Jesus appeared to the women and people later, it doesn't really mean that. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's probably it's, like, yeah, let's grant that this isn't very probable. I would say it's still very more probable than an actual resurrection, even if Yahweh exists and resurrections do happen, right? It's just uh, the question of probabilities. So maybe it lowers the probability from here to here. But the way I'm seeing it, the probability of the resurrection hypothesis is, is so far down, it's actually hovering somewhere above Fiji on the other side of the globe. Okay, let me see if I can summarize this, and then we'll talk about Blake. Um, yeah, by, by the way, do you, uh, do you also wonder what happens to the body? <laughs> Oh yeah, let's talk about that. Go ahead. What do you? Yeah. How do you? What's the natural explanation for Jesus's body? If if this is all bunk, if this is actually a Jesus-shaped cloud, how do you explain that a body was never produced? Yeah, exactly. So I mean, uh, I think the most uh, recent scholarship of, of on earlier practices of uh, crucifixion victims uh, say that if the victim was buried which is already exceptional because most people were just left on the cross to decompose. I'm just granting that Jesus was buried, uh, would be actually placed in a trench grave, which is just like you dig up a hole, uh, the shape of a human body, you throw the body in the pit and you cover it with dirt, right? Uh, so this is uh, like the prior probability of this is, this is, this is the hypothesis that with the highest prior probability, just based on the fact that this is what was done the most common. Um, so that was probably what happened to Jesus. I don't think that the uh, burial narratives in, and then this is, by the way, uh, completely consistent with the Pauline epistles, because the Pauline epistles and the creed just say that Jesus was buried. They don't say anything else about it, right? They don't say that he, he was buried by Joseph of Mar Arimathea, which I don't, I'm granting that he was a historical character who, a character who actually lived. Uh, it doesn't say that he was buried in a rich man's grave. It doesn't say that the grave was mm, found empty, uh, under tomb was found empty. Uh, so uh, based on the prior probability, this is the most probable. And I don't think that the uh, empty tomb narratives are ev pieces of evidence that move uh, the probability very strongly against that hypothesis, because I can explain why those narratives exist, even if the uh, story is false. And the question is like, why wasn't the body produced? Well, this presupposes that in the short period of time, only about a couple of days, uh, before the body decomposes to a point where it's no longer recognizable, someone would be interested in actually debunking it, right? Uh, so like if, for example, nobody cared for a week or a month, then that's already too late, especially given that Christians have uh, tools in their disposal to deal with this kind of information. Like I think it's given what we know about psychology, even if the body was produced, uh, early Christians would be much more likely to conclude that it's a demonic deception uh, than to give up uh, all of their beliefs regarding Jesus that they have developed over the years of following him, right? And I think this is very plausible because even today there are Christians who believe in demonic activity. For example, Brexton Hunter very recently said that some of the miracles in other religions are probably demons. So if he can do it, yeah. why not Peter? Actually, one of my, uh, his name's Aaron, one of my subscribers named Aaron uh, passed this along to me to pass to Braxton Hunter. 
and I thought it was brilliant. I gave him a thousand. I, I gave him two thousand pine points, I think. And he said, uh, for Braxton Hunter and any Christian apologist listening, come up with a purely naturalistic explanation for Mormonism. Don't appeal to demons. Don't appeal to angels. Don't appeal, appeal to any supernatural realm. But if you were challenged to come up with a naturalistic explanation for Mormonism, I predict you'll end up saying and sounding like Camille right now. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's going to be even worse because you will end up saying that Joseph Smith was basically a con artist, which I am not saying True. about anyone, any of the early Christians. I am not, don't think that Paul was in it for the money. I am not saying Peter was in it for the money. I don't think that the gospel authors were lying or being deceptive, even though they probably wrote things that they knew did not happen in history, right? Um, so, yeah. Oh, I, I thought of a problem with your naturalistic explanation while you were talking, though. Mm -hmm. if, if the idea that the Messiah would raise, be raised bodily happened before, even before Jesus was born, you made a comment that even after a week, if they would have figured this out, it would have been too late. The body would have been de too decomposed or whatever. But if they had this idea before even Jesus was born, wouldn't they have gone to the tomb or wherever Jesus was buried? Check. And, yeah, and check. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually great. Uh, yeah, so that would be evidence that very strongly points toward the idea that they developed uh, this um, later, right? Um, when it was too late to go check, right? It's it's also based on the assumption that they actually knew where the body is, right? Because if, like, the idea that the location of the tomb was known, uh, that's only there. It's like it's part of the story of the burial in the rich man's grave. But if Joseph of Arimathea, who I'm granting actually existed as a person, didn't bury Jesus, then for all we know, the location of the tomb wasn't known, right? Uh, but anyway, like, yeah, that's a very good point that I didn't think about. Uh, that's why I'm here. That very, yeah, that's very, that, 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 that would favor very strongly the, the idea that the disciples uh, actually figured it out, like, uh, two weeks later, and it was already too late. Um, okay, and yeah. I, I want to I wanna close off all the other things that Christian might say, uh, or at least bring it up. Um, Okay, you've explained 1 Corinthians 15, the creed. Uh, and I can, I, can, I can actually sort of hear Christians kind of sort of buying that if you pretend everything else is gone, like uh, the Gospels, yeah. Epistles, Acts. I think Catholics are going to buy it because there is a lot of similar things going around even today uh, in Catholicism and Pentecostals. And so then when I introduce those things back, the Gospels and some of the Epistles, you're saying that people would expect this to be written in a genre that even though it says that Jesus appeared, they would understand, no, that never really happened, at least not the way it's portrayed. Um, well, Michael Akonas is it, and Craig Keener. Yeah, about John, yeah, um, Gospel John. But we still got to seal up some other holes here in your theory, Camille, and that is, how, do you, how does your naturalistic explanation explain the transformation of lives, the growth of Christianity, and most importantly, the martyrdom of those who um, knew Jesus. Yeah, exactly. So this is, uh, as I said, all of these things, I don't think, don't uh, move the probability in either direction, because all of these things are completely consistent with the early Christians having a sincere belief that Jesus was raised, which is false, right? Like a false belief that you hold... Uh, that you hold very sincerely transforms your life just as much as a true belief. That's why we have transformed lives in every other religion. Um, and when it comes to growth of Christianity, if you actually read uh, even Christian historians like Tom Holland, uh, there is a Christian historian who has the same name as the actor who plays Spider-Man right now. Uh, and he's one of the pro most prominent scholars on uh, the early Christian history. Um, so when you read his book, like the way how he explains why Christianity was so, so popular, he doesn't say it's because Jesus was raised. He believes that Jesus was raised. And he maybe thinks that this is why the first Christians started believing that he did, because it actually happened. But then he writes like 500 pages detailing various political, economic, and uh, social uh, factors that contributed to popularity of Christianity. So 
even Christian historians don't think that the resurrection has anything to do with why Christianity was popular and not some other religion. Yeah, and I think even Christians re realize that using transformed lives is a horrible argument, using growth is a horrible argument. Um, I think they would m mostly focus in on um, the martyrdom. And we did a video on that a while back. Yeah, you can. You could say that the reason why Christianity was so popular uh, and why the lives were uh, were transformed and stuff like that is because the whole, of the Holy Spirit. Like, it wasn't just that there was this miracle at the beginning. Uh, God was then like fueling the movement through the Holy Spirit, right? Which might be true, but that's actually a different hypothesis than the hypothesis than the resurrection, right? So you have to establish right. it independently. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's, Blake, uh, if you're still in the live stream chat, let me know. I, I don't know what to say here about Blake because uh, before we went on, Blake said, I'll come on, but there's stipulations. And I'll be very honest and transparent. That rubbed me the wrong way when someone tells me how to run my channel. But I do understand, like, he's free to give an ultimatum, either this or I don't come on. And, um, and the ultimatum or the stipulations were that I can't make any snippets of this video. Now, we've been talking for close to an hour, and Blake hasn't been on here. So if he does come on, if I do agree with it, I can't even snip out just the portion with Blake in it, according to Blake. <laughs> um, and it's like anybody else can snip at this and put it on their channel, but I can't. That rubbed me the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, like technically you couldn't even take a clip of just two of us talking because it would be in the same video, right? Like we would have to cut the stream and start again. Well, <laughs> if you, yeah, if you, but I, I think he was thinking under the pressure that he would be here from minute one. But, yeah. Uh, but still, like even he did say that uh, we talked about doing a review video of this. So if, if Blake comes on and if we do a review video of this, uh, if, let's say Cam wants to chip in his five cents because he's, I've invited Cam by the way, but actually let me double check. But yeah, no, he hasn't seen it yet. So uh, yeah. time zones and everything's a problem. But even if Cam said, oh, guys, you missed this, uh, I can't even have Cam come on and talk about what's going on here unless I play the whole entire video, which could run three to four hours. I just think that's unreasonable. Now, I understand why Blake is saying this. Well, he basically told me why he was saying this. But even if I was to tell you guys why he says this, I think I'm going to be labeled as um, misinterpreting or uh, just... This is what bothers me, is that the scriptures themselves in the New Testament says that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. The gospel is foolishness to anyone who's not a true Christian. And I think the issue here is that Blake is scared I'm going to make him look foolish or that I'm going to misrepresent him, or that I'm going to embarrass him. Even yeah, if... let me... Yeah, sorry, let me just say, uh, it's very unfortunate he, that he didn't, uh, uh, didn't participate, because I actually wanted to give him a gift, given that he's a, a fresh father, pretty much uh, as I am, and because I really like him. And it's just, I wanted to present my case, and I was perfectly happy to be on the defensive for as long as possible, because I suspect that a lot of apologists are tired of defending all the time, right? right. right. Yeah. Because most atheists don't put forward and don't are not willing to defend a very well thought out alternative explanation of what happened, like uh, getting Bart Ehrman to tell you what probably happened to Jesus is very difficult. And I think he tries to avoid it on purpose when he's debating because he has a lot. Yeah, he has a lot of experience with professional debating. So he knows to good of, do a very good job. It's enough for him to poke holes in the reliability of the Gospels, right? Yeah. Uh, and then the apologist is on the defensive. So I was just completely willing to uh, be pounded for an hour, two hours, however long he wants to. And I wouldn't push back. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I have a lot of questions that I can ask him see, about the resurrection. But, uh, see, I, I, I'm still struggling with this because Blake, if you're listening, there could you could come on and there could be like a five minute back and forth between you and Camille that's just golden. 
I mean, absolutely, everybody should see it. But there's going to be many, many people who refuse to see it because they look at the video length and they say, oh, it's two and a half hours long. I'm not going to watch this. Now, sure, we can timestamp it and so forth, but I, I just know that's how a lot of people think. They say, oh, forget that. I'm not going to watch a two and a half hour video. And for you to say, I can't even, I can't even take a snippet of a wonderful back and forth because of fear that I'm going to, what if I had promised you this, Blake, that I won't edit it, but I'll still snip it. Are you okay then? That, let's say from a certain time stand, but my guess is he's gonna say no, because there's gonna be something later he'll say to help, under, help people understand what is in, within that snippet. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if the issue is optics, uh, we can set up a formal debate on some other channel, like Modern Day Debate or something like that. There is an up and coming YouTube channel who does uh, debates as well. It's called the Gospel Truth. Uh, they are growing pretty fast and they had some high profile people. So why not? But it just, it saddens me that especially like uh, I'm a very dangerous guy in a sense because I know <laughs> Blake's type of Christianity. And it saddens me that it, it comes down to optics that, um, you know, we don't want followers of Christianity to get, be, have doubt. And um, so if, if I snip something that causes doubt later in followers of Jesus Christ, uh, there's huge repercussions of that. And it's just, but this should be expected. You should expect suffering and persecution and and that people will view Christianity as foolish. I, I would think that would be the default position in, for Christianity, especially um, conservative Christianity. Okay, Blake is then saying, let's make this work. You know I'm just worried about being misrepresented. Right, I understand, Blake, but that's why I always, if people really care about you, Blake, they will watch the full video. If people really are worried about, even non-Christians worried about misrepresentation, they will watch the full video and they will judge for themselves. Um, you know, I'm just worried about being misrepresented. So if we agree in advance that the relevant context is included, then we're good. Okay, I agree with that too. Um, so th I have another motive for having you come on right now is because I really have to go to the bathroom and I want you two guys just to talk so I can go. <laughs> so tell you what, Blake, I will send you a link um, and send it to you on Facebook. I think you already know the link, but I'll send it to you. And then you can come on, and I'm going to leave, and you two can talk. I'll come back. Is he, is he going to be able to, like, is there something that he needs to set up first, or or do you do you need to do something for him to, to come on? Well, I have to screen capture him, but that's about it. OK. <laughs> Karag says, stop trying to scare Blake off. Yeah, you're right. But even that, you know, it's like, oh, here he is. <clears throat> okay, uh, let me uh, screen capture you and Blake. Like, is there something that you can up Oh, you have to yeah, mute. I think you, yeah, you, have yeah, to mute. you might want to mute the, mute the, the stream YouTube. on your side. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move me, put you on top. Can you hear us, Blake? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. Very good audio. Yeah, well, we can make this work. I, I mean, I want to have this conversation. I really do. I just um, am, am wary because, um, you, as you know, I wasn't a big fan of the last snippet. And so let's just agree on the snippets that we do that it'll just be approved of. Is that OK? Yeah, I can do that. You mean send you the snippet first? Send me the snippet and then get approval. And I promise you, if it's just me saying something stupid, that's not going to stop me from having it put up. What I'm worried about is misrepresentation. So just I want to make sure the context is yeah. there. If, 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 if there's something stupid that I say, then there is no way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to ask for Camille's approval. <laughs> is, okay. is, is, is that okay? Is that Because, is, again, I want to be fair about it. Is that all right? Uh, yeah, I'll say yes. But I'll tell you, <laughs> it's under protest because I really it, – it's to me, it's almost like someone knocking at my door – and saying, you know, I would love to come and visit with you, but the temperature of the house has to be 76 degrees, and uh, I'll only sit on this certain type of chair. It's yeah, like, it's just annoying. <laughs> it's like, well, then don't come into my house, you know? Um, yeah, I, but, I, I, but, I, I but anyhow, I have I to totally pee so badly right now that I'm just willing to say yes to anything. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so you guys go ahead. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's just talk about your baby. How is it yeah. going? You know what? You're gonna hear him crying in the background, probably. So, okay. I got my mother-in-law helping helping take care of him, and it's been wonderful. So, man, good to be on with you, Camille. I, I I'm really looking forward to talking about this with you, and I really appreciate you diving into it because a lot of guys won't even try to provide an explanation for the data, and you you stuck in, your neck out, and you've put some work into trying to get a theory out there. So. And you do, and, and you do it in terms that I like a lot. Um, so there's a couple, you know, a couple ways we can do this. Y'all, we actually didn't talk much so far in the video that, that y'all been making about um, the the hypothesis that I put forward. In other words, it's all been your theory right now. Um, but of course, because we're Bayesians, we got to compare them at the end of the day. Um, and maybe today we'll just focus on the plausibility of the theory you're putting forward. Um, cause of course there's a ton, uh, to cover. Right. Um, so just, yeah, yeah, uh, ju 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 just, yeah, I, I just wanted to focus on the prior probability as well. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to start by asking, um, given that we are not going to be talking about the evidence that much, would you say that if what I'm proposing just happens to be true, do you think that would, uh, explain the data? Meaning, um, I'm talking. I'm asking about likelihood ratio, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, on, on my view, the so the data here just refers to the typical evidences brought up for the resurrection: the empty mm -hmm. tomb, yeah. the um, well, the belief in in Jesus is actually appearing. That's a little bit different because I think we we're trying to account for different data. In your mind, the data is them having seen a cloud and interpreting it as as Jesus. And that's different data than no than we are I actually say. we are actually talking about the same data the data yeah. is are the accounts because we don't okay. actually have the cloud or jesus we mm -hmm. just have the texts okay. so that's what we are that's what we are a basically um, trying to explain right so the question is, and of course there are other things mm -hmm. than the minimal facts like the differences in the gospels and stuff like that so like if i happen to be correct somehow mm -hmm. Do you think that it would explain the data? Okay, um, real quick. So normally the data that I would put forward that are typically uncontroversial would include um, the apostles genuinely believing that they saw Jesus. We're altering the traditional data just a bit and I'm not opposed to it, okay? So if you wanna set the data as just the text to themselves, it's a non-traditional way to do it, we can work with it. So let's let's set the data as just the texts um, themselves, not the traditional so-called facts. Um, and yes, yes, you would explain. I think I think you would explain the data with that theory. Yeah, I, I would. I would be even more humble. I would say that, like the the likelihood. I would be completely happy to concede that the likelihood ratio is like 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 uh, one to ten in your favor. It's important that it's not like one to 100 billion in your favor, right? Because as we all both know, like the McGrews have a chapter in the Black Hole Companion of Natural Theology when they just took, when they just claim that the martyrdom is like 100 times more likely on the resurrection hypothesis. There were 12 martyrdoms, they just multiplied and they said that the evidence is like 10 to the 34th power more probable, right? So you don't think that. Yeah, no, I think in fact the probability on, on uh, of the data uh, given um, the hypotheses in question is, is pretty high on both models. And of course that allows us to move the discussion towards how plausible the model exactly. is, how internally yeah. coherent is it? Um, and so someone, you know, someone could make up any sort of explanation for the data and, you know, we, we could posit aliens, um, and I can make it a hyper specific aliens time travelers hypothesis that would explain the data, but it could still be a terrible hypothesis. And yeah. so you're right. Or Satan. Focus on. Yeah. Okay. And so, and of course our conversation again has two components. We don't have time to discuss why. The internal plausibility of, of my hypothesis we're just going to focus on yours right now so, is that good yeah sure go for okay. it um and one thing i think i do want to figure out at the beginning so the idea is just to to recap what the grand hypothesis is the the, the evidence you're wanting to explain is the reports 
um, of of the empty tomb? Is that or more than that? No, ju just the text, right? So, okay. like, out of, of the texts, I yeah. am uh, basically distilling the things that are directly relevant to the resurrection. So, the creeds, uh, the speeches in Acts when they mention the resurrection, well, so, uh, the stuff that's in letters, and then the. Real quick, uh, real quick. Um, so, uh, but there's more data than, the, than what's in the text. So, for instance, we have data that uh, Christianity. Uh, came to exist and it came to flourish. Yeah, um, absolutely. That Christianity wasn't falsified in a way that uh, wiped out the movement early on. So there's a there's a lot more data than would just be in the text that we need to account for. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that, that my point was that just to clarify that the content of the evidence is actually the text, not uh, what we might infer is true based on the text, right? Uh, just because like the text is all we have. But of course, there are other things that are also the case. Mm -hmm. And oh, I would also include, obviously, the evidence that we don't have, right? Because it could be the case that on one of the hypotheses, we would, we would expect to have some evidence that doesn't actually exist. So that would move the probability as well. So yeah. I yeah. And, and I mention that because it tends to be more efficient to focus on the uh, what would ideally be facts um, that we can agree upon rather than just the text. So, um, like, um, uh, like I, I can forget his name. Um, the guy who, the guy who runs Pine Creek, um, Doug, Doug, Doug? Yeah. Doug. Yeah. So like, like Doug was, uh, asking you before he, he was saying, Hey, Christianity seemed to, you know, explode on the scene around 80, 30, uh, when Jesus was crucified. Um, what was in the content, if I'm hearing you right, of what, uh, of what exploded on the scene was um, the 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 people believing um, that that Jesus did appear upon uh, seeing a cloud, right, uh, and then in, in interpreting it a particular way, um, and and you you say that they believed in an empty tomb as well uh, because this was a bodily resurrection on their assumption, right? So. Um, as Doug kind of uh, alluded to, just as an example of what I mean here, um, one common argument is that it would be glaringly obvious that you could just falsify the movement by producing Jesus's body. Mm -hmm. um, what you were suggesting in response was, well, maybe they just didn't know where the body was. And so I've got probably 40, and, and I'm not exaggerating, like 40 lines of attack um, uh, spreading across what, what you're saying, but just starting with one, cause we got to start somewhere. Um, what do you, what do you think about, um, this quote, uh, from Dale Allison? He's a, a well-known, um, probably one of my favorite, he, 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 he'll call himself sort of a spiritual Christian, but he's not, I don't think he's really a Christian. Um, uh, Dale Allison, one of the greatest New Testament scholars around historians and Giza Vermes, who's a Jew. Uh, these are two quotes from them. So Dale Allison says, quote, it is instead quite likely that people friendly, hostile, and indifferent witnessed Jesus's end and its immediate aftermath and that his crucifixion and burial became immediately the stuff of street gossip so that anyone who wanted to learn what happened could have just asked around. Um, that was in his 2005 book on the topic. Uh, Giza writes, fact uh, that organizers of the burial was slash were well known and could have easily been asked for and supplied an explanation. Um, and the idea is, is this was a big public event. Like people knew this was going on and it's, it, it's highly implausible that they wouldn't know where the body was placed shortly after. And they were proclaiming just as you say, shortly after that Jesus, that they saw Jesus alive and that it was bodily. So one piece of evidence that isn't even in the text that we want to account for is the explosive flourishing right at Pentecost, even uh, when the, the population of Jerusalem swelled threefold because everybody was pilgr pilgrimaging, pilgrimaging there um, for the event. Um, and they were proclaiming he's, he's, been, he's risen. His body's not in the grave, remember? Uh, and, and by the way, um, kind of as you pointed out, speeches in Greco-Roman biography or historiography in general don't need to be word for word. They, that, they rarely were. And this was, you know, and, and, and everybody knew this, but you were required to encapsulate as, to get it as close as possible. And you, and you, um, 
if you had traditions on what was said, you needed to incorporate that in there. For long, long reasons, the speech that we have of Peter that Luke recorded in the book of Acts um, for Peter at Pentecost regarding the um, resurrection of Jesus, they widely consider this to accurately represent what Peter was saying, not word for word, but in content. And part of the important content was um, something that he would re- that we see in Acts over and over again that he's repeating, which is that Jesus's body was not left to decay. Okay, he's quoting from the Old Testament there. Um, this was part of his message uh, that he proclaimed to all these people at, at Pentecost uh, very shortly after the um, uh, crucifixion. And this, real quick, one more thing. The idea is, is anybody at this time would have just naturally said, well, pfft, Let's go look at the body. I mean, you're claiming that this guy rose from the dead. The body's right there. And it would have been too clear to uh, critics of Christianity, to the believers themselves. I mean, that's the first thing they would check. Their families didn't want them to believe in Jesus. That's the first thing their families would go check. Um, so anyways, for several reasons, we have good we have good reason to believe that everyone would quickly go check the tomb, in which case Christianity would have been falsified like that because the tomb was right there in Jerusalem where the apostles were. Uh, and what's the question? Well, the question is, is if the uh, body wasn't really missing, um, then how did Christianity survive in those first few weeks? Um, sure. So we can be confident that they looked. And again, my point of bringing this evidence up rather than all the others is because this isn't even a textual evidence. Sure. So let's let's lo- lo- role play this, right? Mm-hmm. So you are going to be a Jew. Let's say that it's a week after the resurrection uh, mm-hmm. or after the burial, and you notice that there is this group of people who are claiming that this criminal who was recently crucified is actually was actually rose, uh, risen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you ask the Romans where they buried him. They show you the trench grave. You dig the body up and you drag the corpse to Peter and the, you know the rest, and you tell them, "Look, this is the." This is the the body. So what would you say as a as a Jew who did that? So first off, two things. Um, one, uh, if they pulled out any body whatsoever, okay, that would have been a big hit to the the Christian movement early on, and that would have made you would see polemics throughout the New Testament text because the damage control would be would be massive. Um, yeah, sure. So no, I, no let, let's role play this. Let, yeah. Let's role play this, right? So you are the Jew with let the body. Let me get through. So let, let me get through. What, what would you say? Let, well, let me. Let me. Okay, I don't want to. I want to answer your question directly. Yeah. If that happened, what would I say? If I were sorry, did you mean if I was a first century Jew who yeah. saw it, or a first century Christian? No, if you were a first century Jew uh-huh. who. Like and you notice that there is this movement of Jews, other Jews, mm-hmm. who for whatever reason became convinced that a criminal who was crucified a week ago was actually yeah. raised from the dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you decided to to kind of explain that to them what actually happened. So you asked the Romans, okay, where did you put the body? And they point to a trench grave, so you dig up a male body, and you drag it to Peter and the early Christians, like, what would you tell them? It wouldn't be me dragging it. This would be a much bigger event involved. When they're proclaiming this, sure. these people are masses. They, they, they would go there. This would, be, this would be far more official, and you couldn't just dig up a grave like that in those times. That was the, the way they um, thought about bodies and tombs. There were big legal I mean, big problems with doing that. So this would have been more of an official event that the Romans would have ha- would have had to give the okay to. Um, and yes, they then the Romans would go make it happen because they they didn't they don't want Christianity to spread. Jews don't, and the Romans don't. And yes, they would they would dig up and they'd say, "Look, the body's right there." And that would be. And what would they say? What would the Christians say? What? Wait, wait, wait. What? The Romans didn't want Christianity to spread, so that's what they would do. No, it's the Romans would the Jews didn't want Christianity to spread. Yeah. That was terrible. The Romans didn't didn't want it to spread either. The point okay. is that the Romans wouldn't hesitate to comply and get this body dug up and shown. So why is in Acts, why like it seems to be that in Acts nobody actually cares about what happened to Jesus? Because like from the Roman perspective, assuming that the guards 
a do two narrative is actually happened. Like all the Romans know, because the guards told them, is that the disciples stole the body. You don't which believe is that. a you criminal that. offense. Hold on, we're we're working on the supposition which I'm gonna to get to that yeah. Jesus was buried in a trench grave, so there weren't any guards on that hypothesis. Well, right. do by the do by the guards or not? Because it seems to me that your do, objection. Let's, let's stick with the trench burial real quick, because that's what we started. Yeah. With. Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. come to that. The idea is, is yes, the body would be dug up. Yes, it, but for I mean, you got tons of historians commenting on how that would devastate the movement of Christianity. Um, I'm going to get if we have time to talking about well, how implausible I think it is that people who weren't—I mean, they weren't Christians at the time. These were these were Jews. They they didn't expect this at all. This would be absolutely devastating. And you hear historians talking about this over and over again. I don't think on your model that Christianity would have ever started. I don't think they had the psychological mechanisms in place to look at a cloud and make that inference. Sure, sure. But, so yeah, but setting okay. that aside, setting that yeah. aside, we, we need to deal with you know in thinking together because I I. I will help you try to come up with the best naturalistic explanation because we're truth seekers together. But I don't think that this one will work um, because I do, I do think that the evidence best supports the missing body. We're looking at 1% of my reason, but that 1% that we're focusing on is that in this early period, it's just, it seems very clear. Lots of historians say they would go right to the body. If it was pointed out, if it didn't falsify Christianity right out off the bat, that small movement, what would happen is there would be major, um, waves, repercussions that we would see traces of throughout the text of them having to do deal with damage control. And that's not there. Okay, the best cool. explanation being that the body was there. And I would, if I were you, I would sooner move to something like the theft hypothesis myself. Sure. So let's, let's change the hypothetical it to, so that it is more in line with what you're saying, right? So let's say that Christians start proclaiming their message. The Jews start freaking out. So a large group of Jews gathers, they ask the Romans to officially and the, the priesthood to officially exhume Jesus's body so that it's in line with all the uh, rituals. Mm -hmm. And they parade the body, like this crowd of Romans and Jews before the Christians. And they tell, so what do you tell them? Like you are the leader of that group, role play that for me. Like, how do you imagine this would actually go up? I, I don't even go know. That they would, I don't know that they would parade it. Maybe they would if if it was catching on fire as much as our reports say it was. Mm -hmm. But no, you you just say this is this is the body of Jesus, and you could even pull in the people who were involved in burying the body. Okay, so so you would just point to the corpse. Yeah. Who 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 has the like all the. Uh, it's a cru crucifixion victim, right? So it's got all the scars and all the holes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You would pull the, you would like drag the, the Roman soldiers who were actually in charge of the burial. And you would like just tell the, the Christians to like, okay, look, this is, this is what's actually going on, right? I so don't they, they probably wouldn't care to talk to the immediate Christians. They would talk to all the people who were like, is this true? And they would show it to enough to people. It would get around. I mean, it wouldn't be a secret. Okay, cool. So yeah, I mean, the way I'm imagining it is that the Christians would probably look at the corpse, then they would look at the crowd, and their reaction would be something like, he's a witch, burn him, right? <laughs> because I think, so like, given what we know about human psychology and how people work, I think it's much more probable that the like the, the early Christians would become convinced that this is a, a demonic deception. Because you have to remember that for them, the Romans and the Jews were basically being controlled by Satan, by the ruler of the age, right? They were like completely corrupt and completely like uh, controlled uh, by the forces of evil. That was like one of the most central tenets of Jewish apoc apocalypticism. We don't not only see that in Christianity, but in other uh, like anti-establishment uh, Second Temple Jewish movements. Let me, let me uh, throw something at you real quick because yeah. um, I, I think this would be an, this is an idiosyncratic expectation because a lot of historians are writing on this, and I haven't seen anything like that. Um, maybe what's happening is you're assigning to these early Christians a deep sense of confidence in their worldview, the kind of deep confidence that you see only 
occasionally in Christians, even today. So it's true, you have a movement of Christians now who have become very dogmatic about their beliefs. Um, they're so they're confident. You know, you and I have seen them. Um, in the case of this movement of, of early Jews who like had a, I mean, let's, pr we have no evidence whatsoever that any early Jews expected a, a dying and rising Messiah and historians over and over again say that's, that's just not, that's just not there. It doesn't exist. We're still, we're supposing maybe it was a small one that didn't leave any evidence. Even if it's implausible, it's okay because, Hey, we're comparing it to a resurrection. We'll take anything. <laughs> okay. So I get that. Um, so, uh, but the idea is even, even granting that there was this movement of people that expected, um, against all, all literature that we have on the Messiah, a dying and rising Messiah, um, even granting that they wouldn't have the kind of confidence that would take them through seeing the body, uh, in those circumstances, and especially not allowing them to see a cloud and say, oh, that's him appearing to us. Uh, there again, there's all sorts of other problems I want to raise that we'll get to, but I think that that would be the one of the biggest first challenges. Is I don't think their confidence would be there. Um, both the expectations of historians and all of our documents from multiple sources suggest that they be they behave just like anybody else whose messiah got got killed and put down. They it was time to go home and get oh, either go home or get a new messiah, right? Um, and, and they didn't, and they're, they're not in the, the kind of confidence that they displayed as a result of what they experienced, I think defi defies the, the, the hypothesis as it stands currently, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. I mean, that just seems to be to be completely ad hoc, right? Like, why, is, why assert as an auxiliary hypothesis, I guess, to the resurrection that they were not like not feeling very strongly about it because you have to realize like at this point they would be convinced that actually the old testament is was talking about jesus specifically all along right mm -hmm. so they would have to sooner be convinced that either jesus wasn't the messiah all the Old Testament is not actually scripture because the prophecies right. about the, the yeah, Messiah here, was, were not fulfilled. Here's what they wouldn't have confidence in. What you're supposing in your hypothesis is that they did a sort of puzzle piece with different parts of the Old Testament and put together that the Messiah would die and be raised from the dead. Now, th there is no clean puzzle piece way to do this, okay? That's why there were no Jews, as far as we can tell. And we've got tons of liter like unimaginably large swaths of, uh, of Midrashic literature, the ways that Jews thought it was a ton. And we see th it's, it's heavily documented that there's no notion of that. If mm -hmm. there were a clear way to make that connection that the Messiah would die and rise, we'd, we'd be seeing some traces, and, and there's no traces. Yeah, Here's I agree. what they wouldn't be confident in. They wouldn't be confident that the Messiah would die and rise. And if they weren't confident that the Messiah would die and rise, they wouldn't be able to look at a something as very much unlike Jesus as a cloud and say, oh, that's Jesus risen from the That's the Messiah risen from the dead. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree that there isn't any straightforward way to do that, because I agree that if there was, uh, we would probably see someone doing it sooner, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which kind of puts people in really awkward position because then you are saying, yeah, the Old Testament was actually predicting Jesus all this time. It's just nobody noticed until the prophecies were fulfilled, right? Which could be the case, but then I'm wondering what's the difference between those kinds of prophecies and Nostradamus? Because I can show you in Nostradamus where it clearly says that the uh, you know, the lion will attack two towers, and that's uh, talking about 9-11. But if nobody uh, before the attack happens can figure it out, then that just seems to be like a post hoc rationalization. But that, that's just a digression. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean... And I did want to say, because that's directly related to that, um, that there is a connection. That, I mean, because you see those connections between um, what happened in the, the to Jesus and then the Christians pointing to the Old Testament. You're exactly right about that. But when you see how they point at it, it's very ad hoc. It's not something you would have guessed. 
Um, so let me let me share a quote from um, again one of my favorite New Testament scholars, Ben Witherington, um, where he explains um, the relationship between this prophecy and and the Old Testament text. He says, "Quote: Thus, it will not do to suggest that the passion and resurrection narratives in the Gospels are largely constructed from the Old Testament. The outline." And some vignettes of these narratives can already be found in Paul's letters in places like 1 Corinthians 11 and 15. It was the startling things that happened to Jesus at the close of his earthly career, his shocking crucifixion, and then his equally astonishing resurrection that caused the earliest Christians to race back to their sacred scriptures to help them interpret the significance of these events. They did not first find these events in the Old Testament prophecies and then create new narratives out of the old prophecies. This is shown most clearly by the fact that many of the texts used to interpret the key final events of Jesus' life in the original context in the Hebrew scriptures would not have suggested such things to a reader who had not heard of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. I know of no evidence that non-Christian early Jews were looking for a resurrected Messiah, and in fact, the evidence that they were looking for a cruci crucified one is also very doubtful. One more quote that's shorter from Joel Green, who wrote a whole whole piece on this. Like it was dedicated to this because he was reviewing John Crossan's book. And Crossan is, is like the New Testament scholar that kind of threw out a, an idea similar to this. He, he calls it um, historicizing prophecy. Okay, so that's kind of the model that you were teasing. Um, he, Joel Green responding to this says, Crossan failed to consider substantial work of the last decade on the hermeneutics of late Judaism specifically on the question of whether the creation of current history from Old Testament texts was an accepted and widely practiced phenomenon. In fact, while more work needs to be done, study of Pesharim texts from Qumran, post-biblical historiography, and selected apocalyptic writings is already suggesting that the direction of influence was from events to biblical texts. That means the events happened and Jews had the habit of trying to look back and make sense of it um, based on what happened. Um, so there's yeah. there's other models we can do to explain the resurrection, but I, I I'm not this one I I would struggle with a lot. Yeah, well, I would be obviously much more impacted by Christian scholars such as Peter Enns, who has who has also written about it, and who basically said that yeah, like if we could time travel to Hosea and explain to him that the um, son of God coming out of Egypt is actually talking about a uh, like individual Messiah. He would be very surprised. Or, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, it just makes for such a good hypothesis. Right? Like, <laughs> if it if this happened to be true, then it would explain the evidence. I don't think it's very likely, but I think it's like probably orders of magnitude more probable than the resurrection actually taking place, even if Yahweh exists and miracles do happen, right? Yeah. So um, that's that's going to take us to the, some more stuff because I feel like I'm I'm not even one percent done trying to point sure. out that what I what I see as challenges here. Um, we could talk about the evidence for the actual entombment of Jesus. I think that's that's pretty decisive that it wasn't in a in a trench. It wasn't a tomb. Um, I noticed that you'll you'll you, you're wanting to grant um, that the Gospels are Greco-Roman biographies. I don't know if you fully come to grips with the kinds of ways that Greco-Roman biographies were permitted lenience, okay? So you, you mentioned Lycona's work. Um, Lycona doesn't, doesn't allow for the kind of alterations that would be required for this theory, that, that wouldn't have been acceptable in Greco-Roman biography. And ironically, am even among Greco-Roman biographies, there's a range of reliability the Gospels, based on what we've been looking at, are actually pretty high up on the, the reliability scale um, in the range of Greco-Roman biography. So, for instance, when you look at the quotes of Jesus that, uh, that they say, they're pretty darn consistent among the synoptics. Okay, And Greco-Roman biography allowed them to change Jesus' words a little bit to, to make their point because it was all about helping move the story along. But it seemed that the early Christians were extremely careful with the history because of its spiritual significance. They were very scared of messing with what was of what actually happened, their origin story. That throughout the synoptics, right, the um, that there is an a really close, um, more than Greco -bio Roman biography required, really close uh, handling, careful handling that uh, keeps the text 
keeps the Jesus's quotes just as they were given. Okay, to a to a shocking degree, almost. Um, okay. Um, so I mean, like, would you agree with Lycona when he says, for example, that John probably altered the day of the crucifixion for theological reasons? No, no, I actually, you know, what's funny is I, I emailed Mike Lycona about that, giving him a paper on the topic. He didn't have time to look at it, but that paper is absolutely gorgeous in, in reconciling what's going on between those two. I, I guarantee you, if I, if, if you looked at this paper, you would agree these are saying the same thing. I think that's an oversight in Lycona's. Yeah, well, I mean, like, if I wanted to harmonization, I would go to Lydia McGrew, right? Like, uh, yeah. there is no shortage of those, right? Just so you know, um, that I'm not yeah. like a crazy. I think Lydia d does some good work, but I don't agree with all all that she does. Her and her and Timothy McGrew. Um, uh, but on this, uh, for sure. Uh, like I think this is a, a an oversight on Lycona's part. Yeah, I mean, it it makes me like wonder because like if you're so obviously there is a range of what would be permitted to change, right? And these aren't just incidental details because a lot of the things that Lycona, like a lot of the research that Lycona did, for example, on Plutarch. Uh, are like incidental details. Like if you compare the same scene that Plutarch retells in multiple biographies, usually around the end, end, of, uh, end of the Roman Republic, uh, I mean, you can kind of see that, that he wants to uh, emphasize like different things, different character traits of in, in individual people and stuff like that. But it seems to me that in this case, people like Michael Lacona or Craig Keener are actually proposing changes that the authors of the Gospels made changes specifically to the important stuff, specifically for theological reasons, right? So under that hypothesis, John, who they both grant was an eyewitness to the resurrection, mm -hmm. uh, altered the day of the crucifixion because he wanted to connect Jesus's death more closely to the Passover, uh, specifically to the slaughter of the Passover Let me, lamb, right? to you. Let me tell you mm -hmm. something. Um, because of the conventions of Greco-Roman biography, I'm actually perfectly happy with the day being changed, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I don't accept that is because of this paper published by, I think it was Barry Anderson that I passed on to Mike. Um, it's very clear from the, the way that the meal that they, that they engaged in and the verbiage that was used that the days were the same in the Gospels and in the, in the synoptics. Sure, it's but I mean, if it, it, yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, I'm if it, that, I'm open to that that kind of change of them changing the day if they wanted to, because as you pointed out, um, when people went to read Gruffo Roman biography, they weren't expecting the kind of rigid, academic um, precision that we come to know and love today in in modern academia. Um, what they were very concerned with was the flow of the story. And they could make minor minor changes um, freely uh, to to help move the story along. To help, and that's the main reason to help move the story along. So mm -hmm. some of the things that, like Kona points out, is is they can change the chronology of the events. Um, one of the more radical ones is they can take the words from one person and put them on uh, the lips of another, so that they can get the quote out into the text. Um, that's a that's a, a bigger one. Um, they, they can do a lot of spotlighting, like when it talks about spotlighting where, like if you read Plutarch's lives, his, the biographies, Plutarch will give, um, the same, he will narrate the story twice. Okay. The same story in two different areas. In one story, he's, he's going to talk about, uh, a guy coming to visit a dude while he's sleeping. And you only find out in the other recounting of the same event that there were other people next to him. Um, it's Plutarch's writing the same thing in both times. He just doesn't mention the people that were right next to him. Those are more of the kinds of uh, changes that were very, they're very frequent there. Like I yeah. have more I'm talking too much already. Yeah, I yeah, know that's, uh, that's, uh, I mean, I agree with all of that because it makes me wonder like if um, Mike is correct and the day of the uh, crucifixion was changed, then mm -hmm. obviously like, a lot of the components of the narrative in John were invented uh, completely. Uh, like, for example, the reasons that the Sanhedrin give for uh, not 
being willing to enter because they don't want to be defiled because the password mail is coming up, right? Like uh, that didn't happen in history. Uh, but but um, Zach, so so I guess do you agree with Greg Keener, Greg Keener when he says, for example, that Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit into his disciples in John, and he also believes that John was written by John, son of Zebedee, that didn't happen in history. Like, would you agree with that? Yeah, so that again, you're pointing out, you're going right to the most extreme cases, which is which is good. Let, let's talk about them. But I, I wouldn't let the extreme, the most extreme cases, dictate what um, what we're looking at with the rest of it, because we have lots of independent evidence for these other things that we're going to get to, like the, the details of the burial, Joseph of Arimathea, and whatnot. But yeah, let, let's as I recall. What's going on there is with every gospel, unlike modern books, you you had to write on a scroll. Okay, there was a certain amount of length that you had on the scroll, and Greco-Roman biographies tended to take up one scroll. Um, and and yes, you can see truncation of material as you, especially as you get to the end of the scroll and you find it, the the author's you know running out of room. Um, you see some truncation in in Luke at the end of Luke. Um, but in this case, right, it, what, what Keener suggests is plausible. He doesn't know. But what's plausible is that um, he, John thought, thought it was important to convey that Jesus breathed upon the apostles, giving them the spirit. Okay. Now, historically, Luke's account would be the accurate one in saying that at Pentecost is when uh, the spirit came. But because John wasn't going to have time to narrate Pentecost, right? That's that's further ahead. He goes ahead and ha and just says, you know, Jesus appeared to them, and without even giving any time indicators, it goes it goes a little bit further, and it says Jesus breathed on them and gave them the Spirit. Now, this doesn't technically contradict what happened in Acts because he didn't say this didn't actually happen, you know, several days later. But it, anybody reading it that didn't read Luke Acts would assume that it was during the same episode. <laughs> Um, and I think John knew that people would probably make that assumption. Um, but yes, it, you're right in that that would be that would be a significant a significant impression of a change is that he he, he put it earlier. Yeah, that's because I mean here we have a, a guy who wrote a, a very impressive book about miracles, so he's obviously not uh, biased against Christianity, and it seems to me that when he's pursuing this like literary devices theory, he's willing to go as far as claim that like a camera sent back in time would not be able to record uh, some of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus because the author of the gospel invented them so like you wouldn't you would you personally would probably go for a harmonization so you do you wouldn't write it off as a as a, a literary device right or at least not as a fabric like a type of fabrication i don't, I don't think that's quite right um i think that I each of these accounts um are there in lycona nor keener would say that one author would you know is rejecting that the other appearance didn't happen. Some, again, they all had different space uh, on their scroll um, based on what they had written prior. They all had particular goals, like, you know, over the many years of detective work, we know that Luke was very concerned with this, this, and this, and Matthew writing to this audience was very concerned with this, this, and this. Um, and you can even hear, see passing references to appear, like in the Gospel of Mark, there's, a, there's I mean, there are references in Mark to the forthcoming appearance of Jesus, but Mark doesn't narrate it. Okay, he the gospel ends at the the women seeing the empty tomb. Now the early community all knew Jesus went on to appear afterwards, but it was not part of what Mark was aiming for. Same thing in Luke. You see these, you see uh, certain appearances, but you don't necessarily see a one that's narrated in John. Luke never says that didn't happen. He's just he's just focused on some appearances. It, Luke does say that Jesus appeared tons of times, right, o over leading up to Pentecost. Not all of them are narrated. John himself says Jesus performed many miracles that you know he just didn't have time. You know, all the books in the world couldn't hold. <laughs> he you know he's being very exaggerative there, but he, he all of them are saying there's more material than they have time. They have room to narrate. Um, so there's no con there's no contradiction there. None of them are saying he didn't appear. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not saying there is a contradiction, right? Like, I'm just questioning what's the implausibility. 
Yeah. Again, I was just asking what's the implausibility. Like, given what we know about the conventions of the genre, it seems to me that my hypothesis, which just says that the gospel authors knew that early Christians had appearances, they already believed that the um, that the resurrection was physical because that's what Second Temple Jews believed, right? So mm -hmm. they would just create a narrative of Jesus yeah. appearing to early yeah, Christians, that's... which is consistent with their sources. Mm -hmm. And then what we would expect to see is like four different people. Mm -hmm. Well, actually three, because Mark doesn't have appearances, right? So three different people who are independent from each other would come up with a non-overlapping set of appearances, which is different than the set of appearances in First Corinthians, presumably, right? At least nobody narrates how Jesus uh, appeared to jo James, right? Oh, I think we um, have a very clean chart that that puts these together. Um, and actually, yeah, I would love to love to see that. Yeah, oh, exactly. <laughs> And these charts, by the way, are the kinds of things that you expect to find when you're comparing biographies anyways. But let me let me move back for Let me make a suggestion for your model. You wanted to grant that the Gospels are Greco-Roman biographies. OK, you just wanted to say, let's just give that to, you know, the, the Christians. My suggestion to you would be don't give that to them, because if you grant that these are Greco-Roman biographies, um, even on the loosest, ugly, you know, the worst, irresponsible Greco-Roman biographies, you don't have that kind of creation, that degree of creation that you would need to posit in the case of the Gospels. If all that there was is the apostles or, you know, yeah, whoever was there seeing a cloud, the, the whole cloth creation of these long appearance accounts that, that the Gospel authors all share um, – and, 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 and some of them having unique presentations is completely outside the scope of what would be permissible in Greco-Roman biography. Um, so what, what, would you, what would you say is would be the prior probability of something like that happening? I don't know, but it's the, the prior probability is higher that they're not Greco-Roman biographies to begin with. Okay. Is it, is it lower than the resurrection? Do what? Is I'm, it lower I, than the resurrection? Um, that one detail probably, well, again, it depends on who you ask. I just, I don't think that for you, based on your background knowledge that you'd think it was lower. Cause I, I think at least based on your testimony and what you've got going on up there is that pretty much anything's better than a resurrection. <laughs> um, well, no, so I, there are, there are actually things that are much less probable than a resurrection. Well, we're getting pretty extreme when we're talking about um, the hypotheses that have been strung together here. So I, I imagine the resurrection for you is the hypothesis that God would raise Jesus from the dead is incredibly, um, insanely low. Uh, well, I mean, no, well, I'm asking you, right? And I think you, last time you said that you think the prayer probability of the resurrection is very low. Mm -hmm. as well so i'm just asking like on this detail yeah. alone like i right. let's well, let's just grant that on the hypothesis that this is a greco-roman biography uh, let's just grant that the prior probability of this level of narrative uh, elasticity is unlikely uh would you say that it's like the prior probability is lower than the prior probability of the resurrection yes. um yeah. significantly oh, okay cool like uh, orders of magnitude yeah, like uh, one million to one, one in one million to one in one billion. <laughs> um, yeah, I would put there would be a lot of zeros in there. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Because I'm, I'm complete. To be honest, like I'm completely willing to grant that it could be the case that the prior probability of both hypotheses is actually so low that people are just not able to estimate it very well, right? Like it, the, the analogy is kind of like when you're looking at something that's very, that's right in front of you, you will probably be able to describe it very like precisely. But if it's extremely far away, then you're you're losing the ability to describe it precisely because of your limitations, right? Yeah. And I think the same is true when it comes to evaluating probability of competing hypotheses. If these hypotheses have extremely low prior probability. So it could be the case that one of the two hypotheses is like one in one billion and the other one is one in one million, which is a massive difference. It's like three orders of magnitude. But 
people are just not capable of figuring out which is which, right? Because mm -hmm. in both cases, it's actually extremely small. It's like much smaller than the kind of things that we are dealing with in everyday life. And given that we don't have like scientific equipment and stuff like that, I would mm -hmm. be completely willing to grant that we are actually not able to estimate it. But I think that if that was the case, it would be probably a reason to be agnostic about it, right? Like you wouldn't, or at least on epistemic grounds, you might still want to prefer a resurrection for pragmatic reasons, but uh, on epistemic grounds, we would have to say we can't really tell one way or the other. Yeah, I think people are pretty good, even if they're not uh, the best at putting a precise number of zeros, they are pretty good at, at saying, oh yeah, I can feel a gigantic difference in the plausibility of these two hypotheses. Okay, and in this case, whether you want to provide zeros or you want to talk about the extreme disparity in their plausibility, um, I'm going to say that the resurrection is, is doing way, way, way better. Um, which of course is going to depend yeah. on my 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 overall story of why God would raise Jesus. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think people are actually terrible at this, right? Because I mean that's the reason why uh, there are like why there is no consensus, right? Like why the 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 opinions are over all over the place. I, I remember there was a workshop on uh, the prior specifically on the prior probability of the resurrection, and it was hosted by. Uh, um, Callum Miller, and he asked uh, Richard Swinburne and Timothy McGrew, who both uh, wrote about, around it, and they are both Bayesian, what the prior probability is. And I was shocked that one of them, I can't remember which one, when one of them said that the prior probability is actually like low, but fairly high. I think he said like one in 1,000. But the other one said it's like one in billions, basically. And mm -hmm. these are people who you would expect, based on their background and based on their background knowledge, would be pretty much on the same page, right? Because they are both Christians. Nope. They have obviously researched the evidence extensively, and they are still they still come like three orders of magnitude apart, basically. So something to keep in mind is that even Christians have different philosophies that impinge on their expectations. That that actually doesn't surprise me much at all. But I don't, you know, we're going to bore people if we talk too much about. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't surprise me as well. I'm just saying these are the reasons why I don't think people are very good, um, like, you know, very good at estimating these extremely low priors, right? Uh, yeah, because you know, even right. Christians I, can't agree. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I think that if, if Swinburne and McGrew spent time together talking about why they assigned the priors that they did, that you would either come to some clear points of disagreement that explain those differences in priors, or as they introduce more information to each other, their priors would start to converge much more. Yeah, okay. I think they, 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 would, they would probably identify reasons why they diverge. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me talk, talk to me about um, the conversion of Paul. Okay, so he wasn't there for the cloud. Um, you know, and normally I'd talk yeah. about, so there's, there's lots of issues with the cloud, the cloud idea. It, and my mind is reeling in, in questions I want to ask, but let's set it aside, try to be here and just go, go to Paul real quick. So what did you say about Paul? What explains, so he was the, the greatest church persecutor around. Um, he was, he seemed to be a very confident. Was he the greatest persecutor? I don't know. Like, was he a killer? Like, did he kill someone? He, he doesn't say he killed anyone. He yeah. instigated their deaths. Where does he say that? He personally killed anyone, but he's re he cl he claims he's responsible for the death of Christians. Where does he say that in Galatians? Um. Yeah. Let's see here. I mean, it, that's probably not important. Don't don't yeah. worry about it, right? Like, okay. let's let's say that he was like Charles Manson. Right? Yeah, he definitely thought he had Christian blood on his hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can imagine he probably did. Um, given like the kind of. Uh, like period in history that was right. Yeah, uh, so yeah. Anyways, I mean, the, like the piece of da the piece of data, just so people have it. Yeah. There are several lines of evidence for the truth of the resurrection. One of them is that um, that j allegedly Jesus appeared, and we have different different kinds of witnesses. One of those witnesses is Paul. He was a he was a, a hardcore Jew, Pharisee Jew who uh, understood Christianity to be an important threat against Judaism. He thought that the Old Testament was very clearly against Christianity and, and the expectations there. Um, then he go, 
one day, bam, on his way to um, to Damascus. Am I getting it? Yeah. He he. Something happens. He goes through some kind of experience, and in the midst of this, becomes convinced that Jesus appeared to him and commissioned him, and it radically altered his life. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you're obviously taking the Damascus Road experience from Acts, right? Because he doesn't actually, nowhere does he describe, describe his uh, conversion in his own yeah, words. Yeah, but, right? but Paul and Luke, remember, they were tight. Luke knew Paul like yeah, I, I will have to, probably not today, but I will have to read for you on the reliability of Acts. That's probably a massive... I will have to read for you on the real, historical reliability okay. of Acts. I kind of want to do that right now. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, I, like, yeah, I mean, um, just uh, to answer your original question, right? So yeah. I, I think the, like, my explanation, I think there are two things that I think are innovative uh, yeah. when it comes to expla explaining the evidence, right? Like, the first is basically... Uh, taking into consideration the literary theory behind Greco-Roman biographies. And here, as I alluded to, i building on, standing on the shoulders of giants such as Mike Lacona and Craig Keener. And oh, the no. second point, where no, is the... Sorry, yeah, sorry. The stuff isn't related to the biography yeah, yeah i'm going to i'm going to get to that the sec okay. i think the second point where i think there is some innovation is that i'm basically fixing the hallucination hypothesis because the um like one of the most frequent arguments against it is that you have group appearances which mm -hmm. are very improbable given uh, that hallucinations are internal right so i'm just fixing it by proposing something that has external existence. But, uh, we'll, but when it comes to Paul... Question on that before yeah. you get to Paul. Do you think it's suspicious that, because we have a lot of atheist, ag agnostic, from different backgrounds, lots of non-believing historians work that specialize in the New Testament, right? And what I'm curious about is why do you, why do you think it is that um, the hallucination hypothesis is the one that they all go to if they found it plausible that they could look at a cloud and conclude it was Jesus? I think because it, nobody has thought about it before, to be honest. Okay, let me challenge you and say a ton has been published on trying to explain this data. Tons, tons of books. Uh, it's a big, gigantic debate. Everybody who works in the field has some exposure to it. Um, it's something that everybody's very interested in coming up with theories for. And today... To date, the one that really stands out is the hallucination hypothesis. That's the one that they. they yeah. Feel uh, are you aware of anyone who has proposed something like uh, the Jesus shaped cloud before in literature? Maybe it's there, but you know, I've, I've read 25 um, academic books um, on, on the case for Jesus' resurrection and countless articles. I can't recall off the top of my head anyone. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be a case that this is something new, right? Like, new ideas sometimes pop up. Yeah, that's wouldn't true. Here's the thing. If you're not, there's a lot, there's so much. What I've learned in getting in the historical Jesus studies is I go in thinking there's this much information, which is a lot. And I find out that there's a lifetime of publications and information out there, more than I can comprehend. Um and I say that because if, if you're not a historian and you go in proposing a model like that, you're going to be completely aware, unaware of all the lines of attack that can be raised up against your hypothesis. If you want to do the best way, if you want to try to find the best explanation, the best naturalistic explanation, um, look to the expert uh, experts who aren't Christian and see, because they've thought a lot about trying to make sense of this data because they're historians and they're trying to make sense of it. And there's so many people who are interested in it. But none of them have have proposed that, which is one reason to worry. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, this is uh, the the like if there is a lot so much written about it, then you would kind of expect someone would propose it by now, right? So, or, or like if someone proposed it, we would know about it. So, mm -hmm. given that so much has been written about it, and we don't know about anyone else proposing it. It's probably because no one has, right? <laughs> well, uh, it, like, what it is, it, no, no, they, they would, any, I, I suspect, in fact, all of them have considered, hey, maybe they saw something and interpreted it 
as as Jesus. I mean, that that can jump because they're trying. They're looking for psychological explanations because you need to explain their psychological state soon after the crucifixion. But the they um, they see problems with the it, it plaus bigger plausibility problems than the problems associated with general hallucination. They would sure. rather appeal to hallucination than than it misinterpreting a cloud. Yeah. So so yeah. That, I mean, that's an interesting hypothesis, right? So we would have to actually check whether it's true, right? Like we would have to ask a, a couple of people who have written about this before and ask them, like, have you thought about this? And maybe they are going to say yes, and these are the problems. Maybe they are going to say that's actually a great idea. <laughs> you know, I think you're uh, underestimating how much work ha has been done yeah, in trying yeah. to come up with an explanation. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so I mean, let's get back on track, right? So let's yeah, uh, let's Paul. talk about Paul. We're so to I, Paul. Yeah, so what I just wanted to say is that, like, I think my explanation has like two major innovations, basically, mm -hmm. but none of them, as you pointed out, are related to Paul. So when it comes to Paul, I'm just like uh, very old school. So mm -hmm. I'll just rely on what has been done before, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, basically a, a delusion induced by grief uh, over the atrocities that he committed. And uh, I, yeah, I mean, Mike Lacona said it the best. If there was only one guy who hallucinated, then the hallucination would be more probable. So I, I just have one guy, and I don't see the problem. Sorry, I, I don't. I'm not going to grant the the thing that Lacona said because I have no sure. clue the context for why he said that. He's. I'm going to. Yeah. Facebook friends, so I'll ask him what's going on there. But there, there's something underneath that makes me want to <laughs> go a little bit deeper. But go, mm -hmm. but tell me the theory. I mean, so just so you know, maybe this is what you want to do. There is um, a similar idea floating around right now. So uh, Gerd Ludemann um, had published an idea that I think Goulder has um, endorsed, and uh, Richard Carrier, the internet atheist slash historian, um, has taken it up himself. It's not a grief. Um, uh, yeah, they say he's like a schizotypal or something like that, well, right? Carrier. Carrier, only Carrier says that. But um, they call it a guilt complex. So maybe mm -hmm. what happened, and again, this is this is our, our attempt to be real and to try to come up with an alternative explanation, is that maybe in the midst of Paul doing these things, he um, he come, he started to feel guilty for, from what he was doing, um, and started to grow sympathetic to the maybe he was inspired by the Christian movement in some way, and uh, underneath his you know psychology. Deep down, um, there was a breaking point, and it happened to be on the way to Damascus. And in the midst of that breaking point, um, he a, a hallucination was induced, and it had this very specific content of Jesus commissioning him. And he was so confident in that experience that he it changed the rest of his life. And he spent he he became Christianity's greatest uh, persecutor to its greatest advocate. Okay, that's the model, and you're not alone in proposing that. Um, that that actually is out there. There are problems with this, though, as you might expect. Um, all the textual data we have says that Paul was actually super confident in his um, in his persecution of Christians. He we see him boasting about how he was advancing in Judaism. He was a Pharisee. Um, he was he would not be allowed. I mean, he had he understood the Old Testament. He was an expert in it. You can see that in his writings, and he was a trained Pharisee. Um, and if if this contradicted the under he the understanding he had of what the messiah would be i mean a, a feeling guilty just isn't going to do that type of thing you're going to have to address address the old testament text that had him convinced and usually psychology works the other way we we try to justify what we do rather than go through some psychotic you know change like this but i think this hypothesis um highlights the chat the challenge because we have a we, again our Bayesian equation has two components the plausibility of a resurrection and the plausibility of cloud hypothesis plus guilt induced um, uh, the, you know conversion of Paul then we've got the hypothesis that Jesus wasn't buried the you're having to multiply the implausibility of each of these components in order to yeah. get your explanation and I think this exactly. highlights the power of the resurrection argument personally because of how the lengths we have to go to to explain the data.
Does, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I just think that the kind of things that I'm invoking as a, to explain the evidence individually and in conjunction are still like vastly more intrinsically probable than a resurrection, right? Because they are com like very well attested and very well researched and nearly universal features of human psychology and literary theory. So yeah, <laughs> it's not that difficult to come up with an explanation that's more probable if what you're up against is a resurrection, right? Yeah. And this is true even if Yahweh exists and resurrections are actually, actually do occur occasionally. Yeah. Can I pay you a compliment? Yeah. Um, you're, uh, the last time we had a discussion, you, we didn't focus on your theory. We focused on the plausibility of, of that God would raise Jesus. Um, and you dove into part of belief map um, that I had that I just took for granted that, oh yeah, people are going to see this connection. Um, they're going to see the relevance of this. Um, and talking to you, because I, I know you're a really smart guy. And my thinking after that was, man, if Camille doesn't doesn't see what I'm doing, I can't expect other people to see it. So after that, I spent the whole week um, re redoing that part of belief map. I don't know if you saw it. So that now it's because of your influence, Camille, that belief map is different. If you go there right now, beliefmap.org, mm -hmm. because of you, I've added a whole new section. Before there was only one, two, three, four, five. I've added a whole sixth one. Um, to talk about what you were concerned with. So now it says step number one, God exists. Step number two, Jesus is a real historical figure. Step number three, Jesus fits as God's sinless uh, avatar envoy. Okay, that's kind of what we were talking about before. And the fourth one is what I added uh, directly to appease uh, your concerns, which is God plausibly would resurrect Jesus from death uh, or would resurrect Jesus. And the next one is that God did resurrect Jesus from death. And then I go on to say that God will raise all made sinless in Christ. Yeah. Can I, can I okay. run through with you what what my new no, I, here? I will. I would probably take some time to read through it uh, now. The the new version, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, maybe I can give you some some like ideas later. Uh, just yeah. a quick question: like in the um, plausibility section, does it link to the resurrection section? Because then it's kind of circular, right? Oh, You're basically I didn't saying. I talk to you about that because I, you, you had said that during the last video, and I wasn't there to really talk about it. Just so you know how pro, um, propositions work and what belief map expects you to do, there's no problem with circles in belief map because I'm letting you put in your own numbers. For some people, um, uh, they they may already believe that Jesus rose from the dead, okay, or have a high confidence. And now if I'm trying to talk to that person and say, what's the likelihood that God would raise Jesus from the dead? In fact, take Timothy McGrew, who we just talked about. He thinks it's he thinks it's highly implausible that God would resurrect Jesus, right? So yeah. for Tim McGrew, I can send him to this page. And the fact that God did resurrect Jesus from the dead, because Tim agrees with that, will increase for Tim the plausibility that God would resurrect Jesus. And that's a legitimate source of evidence. On the other hand... Yeah. Yeah. If you're an atheist and you don't think Jesus rose from the dead, what your responsibility is is when you get to that page, you're you just strike out that that box because you don't believe in the resurrection and you you're nowhere close to it. For you, ignore that box. But my obligation in presenting an article directly on would God raise Jesus is to give all the possible evidence that anybody might might find interesting yeah that's like that? that's yeah i mean that that makes sense right it's it may be like if you're if you are an outsider and you're just coming to the website uh, like that might seem strange so I, if that's still going on on the website it would be and maybe it's there i just didn't didn't notice it would be uh like it would be good to explain that this is what's going on right because yeah. like on at like on face at face value i thought I this that. is People are already confused enough when they get on the site to figure out how it yeah, works. Yeah. That it that's, would be that's in a, right. it would be in the section. But, yeah. section. By, by the way, it's it's very <laughs> strange that uh, who who did you say if believes in the resurrection but doesn't think it's very probable, pro pro plausible that God would do it? Uh, who uh, is Tim it? McGrew. Tim McGrew. Tim McGrew. Yeah, that's, that's really strange because I'm thinking like God is necessarily efficacious. So if you already believe that he did something, 
then you would think that the prior probability of him intending to do that is one, right? <laughs> because um, if he didn't uh, intend to do it. Because remember, Tim probably believes in, in free will, not determinism. So what Tim's, Tim's probably going to say is that in any given situation, um, like let's say you asked me to pick a number between 1 and 10, and let's suppose, which by the way, I don't, that the number that I choose is freely chosen. I don't usually put that in the category, but let's say it is. Um, let's say um, it's a fact that I'm going to go, I will go on and I will pick um, the number nine. Okay. Well, it can be the case that I have a slight propensity to pick each number. Maybe my, maybe I have the highest propensity to pick seven, but because I chose freely, I landed on 10. Okay. Alternatively, you can say I was torn between each of the options and then it's one over 10 for each one. I had a 10% chance to pick each number. So you can't say that I would pick um, the number nine. All you can say is that I plausibly would pick number nine. Yeah, yeah, I got, okay. Well, I mean, we, we don't probably have to spend too much time on that because now I'm thinking, you know, Richard Swinburne uh, says that the prior probability of God uh, even becoming incarnate, let alone like, becoming incarnate in the person of Jesus specifically, as opposed to just anyone, right? Is one in two, which is very interesting because like if you find yourself existing in a, a possible world, then just flip, flip a coin <laughs> to find out if there is going to be an incarnation yeah, going yeah, on I, in the possible world. I'm not world. convinced by Swinburne's argumentation. Do you mind if I, if I share with you some of the insights though about why God might raise Jesus from the dead? Well, I mean, it seems to me that we are kind of jumping all over the place. Also, Jack says that we are going over two hours, so I'm thinking we might uh, call it a day uh, and maybe talk uh, again next time. Or, or, I mean, if you want to send me back something in writing or even uh, like a reading list. Hold on. Uh, I will still be able to hear you. I just need to do something. Um, okay, well, since you're up I'm, and you can hear me, I'm going to go. <laughs> I've got nothing else to I might as well. well hang on Blake Ed, would you we got a few questions from the live stream chat if you want to hear them oh, cool. yeah, well. yeah. okay yeah I think um, for a lot of people this is really really interesting stuff and for others it's like uh, I was under the impression there'd be no math here today um, <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, but, but the first question is from me and uh, I like props So I'm holding a sealed envelope here. It says, from the kingdom of heaven, from Yahweh. And inside, oh, yeah. inside the sealed envelope is the truth of Jesus' resurrection. Now, if I were to open this sealed envelope and it said that Jesus did not, this is from Yahweh directly. If I was to open this up and it says Jesus was not bodily resurrected, would Camille's naturalistic explanation make more sense to you? No, why, why would it? Okay, that's fine. And then uh, the follow-up question is, what would be your explanation for the resurrection of Jesus or the evidence we see if we knew from Yahweh himself that it actually didn't happen? And so basically, what's my best naturalistic explanation, probably? Yeah, in like two sentences. Of the resurrection evidence. Um, honestly, I, I've thought about it before, and I, I tried to work out a hypothesis, and you're putting me on the spot. I don't remember what I came up with. Uh, pro but it probably would be hallucination in conjunction with body theft. Mm. And for Paul, I, um, um, yeah, I don't remember what I'd do with Paul. I don't know. If if you remember, write something down. Yeah. It would be yeah. really, really yeah. interesting. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the debates where the people are forced to defend the other side, right? Yeah, because... Actually, in, but what is this, Camille? I will, I will work with you because at the end of the day, I say let, let's, you know, let's go to the truth wherever it is, um, and that means putting out the best naturalistic hypothesis we can in order to compare it. Um, so I'm, I'm all down for that. I think that's the way truth seeking should look like. When I first yeah, start, sure. I mean, let, let, 
if you can if you can write some of your thoughts down and send it back in whatever form, right? Even if it's just a, a list of two thousand works that I'm supposed to read. I mean, I, I have a, a lot of free time. <laughs> then <laughs> I, that would be massively appreciated. It would be, of course, better if you structure it a little bit more, like maybe. Um, what some of the possible objections are and who has written about it. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, I will be happy to come up with a, another version. Yeah, yeah. Cool. What, what my, my advice would be for Christians listening is before you come up with your own naturalistic explanation for the resurrection, do it first for Mormonism and then uh, Islam first. So that, that's easy for me, by the way. I've, I've done those already. Okay, but for those... some some people that might not have done that. So to come up with a naturalistic explanation of why uh, that we see uh, texts of uh, Jesus appearing to Joseph Smith. And then uh, get in the habit of just getting that, that pen flowing of the naturalistic explanations and then do it for Christianity, and it might be easier. Uh, Ken Scalita asks, my question is for Blake, why... Why did Mark say that the women never told anybody about the empty tomb? Great question. I've actually got an article on belief map covering uh, this specifically. So let's pull up the text real quick, just so we have the exact. Yeah. Just quickly go to the bathroom. I was st still able to hear you, but hopefully you're not going to be able to hear me. <laughs> I'll mute you if we hear any uh, yeah, st yeah. <laughs> streams of joy. Uh, I mistakenly just put in mark 16 into google and i just came up with a bunch of guns i'm like oh duh i need i need to go to bible gate right here um okay so here, here's at, at the this is how mark ends so and i'll explain to you the relevance of of this person's question so uh the women just arrived at the tomb uh the body was missing the angel said you know look he's gone okay and then it let me read from verse five Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking here for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, quote, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. They, end quote. They went out and fled uh, from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So here's this creative objection that comes as a result of that. Um, one explanation that had been proposed is, wait a second, um, Mark is trying to explain why Christians have not heard about the empty tomb yet. So suppose Mark was inventing the empty tomb story right now, and he wanted to get it past people, the natural question from all Christians would be, well, why haven't we heard about this before? And as uh, I forget who the guy was put it, Mark's basic response here is, oh, you know, women, they, they get afraid and they don't, they don't say anything. So anyways, that's why the, you haven't heard about this before. Um, but if you examine the text, let me see if I can find the, um, where it is on belief map so I can remember. Uh, actually, I don't have search terms for it. There's a you'll see how Mark uses this phraseology of go and speak to no one because um, Jesus healed a man. And uh, the what Jesus said is go speak to no one, but tell the priest about what's happened. OK, go speak to no one. What What it means by uh, he went and spoke to no one was he didn't he didn't speak to people along the way. He had laser focus on where he was supposed to go. So using how Mark it, uh, it uses this exact same verbiage, scholars have said, oh, okay, simple enough. This, this other guy who came up with this funny model um, just is missing what Mark's doing. Mark's saying that the women went straight to the disciples. They didn't speak to anyone on the way. They went straight to where their mission was. Nice and ad hoc, just the way I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the other one's that ad hoc <laughs> for what it's worth. Uh, Paul and how, how Mark uses the language itself because we have an exact the exact verbiage. I think uh, Paul Andrews' question is uh, maybe referring to plot holes in the story of the Gospels. Paul Andrews is asking why would the women anoint a smelly body? Mm -hmm. um, well, so the body wouldn't have been smelly by then. So this was in uh, during a, a time when it was extremely cold. You might remember John needing to go get warmed up by the fire. Uh, very cold 
at this period um, when, and that's what, you know, that sucks to be crucified, but being crucified in the cold is bad too. But when Jesus was uh, buried in the tomb, it would have been extremely cold. The body does not rot long. Not only is it cold, it's extremely dry. You go, we will find well-preserved uh, corpses in Egypt where it's really dry and it'll be years and years and they're still, they're still relatively well-preserved. So it was extremely dry in that area and extremely cold. There wouldn't have been rotting. Moreover, this they would have anointed, gone to anoint the body just a couple of days later. The spices that were put on the body, right, help help keep things not smelling too bad. So, and the women that they're in their mentality, they're thinking, well, this is the person we love. We're going to go, quote unquote, lay flowers down uh, for this person, even if he smelled a little. He didn't. But it's not implausible that they'd go to do that just out of love. Yeah, I'm reminded uh, one gospel says that they went early in the morning and purchased spices. <laughs> you think there were any stores open at that time? <laughs> um, but anyhow, Bohr Bor Machine asks, there were people who believed that John the Baptist had been resurrected, well, especially Herod. Why couldn't they just produce the body of John the ba ba Baptist to show that this was wrong? Uh, Herod was crazy. Um, like, like literally, if you look at the history of Herod, he was, he was mentally not well. Um, I don't think that he was really putting much effort into that. Nobody cared to prove anything to Herod. I um, think you are confusing Herod. your Herods because you are thinking Herod the Great, but this no, is Herod Antipas. Well, the Herods in general were pretty messed up all around, but no, I, I think Yeah, but was... we don't have, we don't have these kind of stories for this guy, right? And it doesn't say Herod. Well, it does say that in Matthew, but yeah. in Mark it says the people. Uh, so it wasn't just him. So I I made I made this uh, Blake uh, a while ago in response to. Um, you probably can't read it. I'll read it out to you. This is a response to Michael Lacona. Michael Lacona said something like, Jesus had been publicly executed and buried in Jerusalem. Then his resurrection was proclaimed there publicly. So for Christianity to get it off the ground in Jerusalem, the body of Jesus could not have been in the grave. Michael Lacona, the risen Jesus. So I, I thought, well, I, this is out of the Gospels. John the Baptist had been publicly sentenced to death and buried in J Jerusalem. Then his resurrection was proclaimed there publicly by Herod at a wedding feast. The body of John the Baptist could have not have been in the grave because his followers knew where John the Baptist was buried, yet could not produce the body. Mark six fourteen to 29, the ministry of Pine Creek. <laughs> Little joke there. But um, I, I think it's a great example of people who, number one, believed in resurrections and were wrong, and number two, could have disproven it and didn't. Let me, so I've got a lot of notes on this. I'm going to have to return to it and remember it, but this is a quote from Richard Swinburne. I'm, I'm going to read it without even knowing what I'm about to read, but I assume it's going to be relevant. Um, he says, two passages which are cited to suggest that belief in resurrection does not require an empty tomb are Mark 16, and it gives more details, blah, blah, blah. And the first passage, Herod Antipas Hearing of Jesus fears that he is John the Baptist who has been raised from the dead, yet he is not reported as making an effort to check the tomb. This is supposed to show that whether the body is still in their tomb is irrelevant to whether someone has been raised. However, the passage recounts just two, just the wild musings of one guilt-ridden man. Others had other views of who Jesus was. It was not greatly important for Herod whether this musing was correct. What mattered to him is that he was guilty in respect of John the Baptist's death, and that someone else was uncannily like him. Herod may well have checked the tomb if he knew where it was, but Mark may not have known of it, nor would it have been greatly important for the story if he had. William Lane Craig says, so far as I can tell, all we get from our skeptical respondents in answer to this problem in Goulder's remark about Peter's, uh, this is something else. Um, and he right, has something to say that I can read, and I've got a big quote here. Yeah, I don't think, I, I don't personally don't think this is a very good point, because, uh, like, I mean, the, the objection that uh, the, the body could have been produced. Because, yeah, I mean, if you want to explain it, you can always say that, yeah, the body actually was produced, and that's why yeah. there isn't a religion uh, built around John the Baptist, right? Well, there actually is. There they is. They are called the Mandians. <laughs> 
but uh, <laughs> but they are not as big as Christians. Uh, yeah, at least about the resurrection. <laughs> but yeah. but uh, interesting, it's interesting enough, uh, Camille. Like when you said, you know, someone could have actually produced the body of John the Baptist and yet not have reported it. I saw Blake's head nodding yes, and that could still be the case for Jesus as well. No, because this was a gigantic movement, in which case there would be a lot of interest in that debate about Christianity. Nobody cared about what Herod thought, um, so it was a very isolated, disinteresting situation. Nobody would talk yeah, about just, it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just want to clarify again that it, in the text it says explicitly says that it wasn't just uh, Herod. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean... You can you can always explain it away, right? It's of course ad hoc because uh, yeah. we don't know that uh, he went to check the body. But uh, yeah, it's definitely ad hoc to say that. And you know, I always get or not always. Sometimes people say that's an argument from silence, Doug. And but it seems like when I hear Christians do it, well, we don't know if anybody checked the 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 tomb of John the Baptist. It doesn't say. You know, it's like, yeah, argument from silence. How come you get to use it? from silences, but go ahead. Okay, but anyhow, um, David B. 22585 asks, if some series of natural events occurred which resulted in a large numbers of people mistakenly believing in a miracle, would we expect those events to have a high probability? I don't know if I understand that question. I, I was a little lost too. If some series of natural events occurred which resulted mm -hmm. in a large number of people mistakenly believing in a miracle, would we expect those events to have a high probability? Oh, I think I understand what he's saying. He's saying that um, couldn't some natural things happen in, in, sequ in sequence, the completely natural, but people mistakenly believe it's a miracle. Would we expect those events to have a high probability? Yes, it's my answer. Well, uh, um, I... Yeah, forget it. Right. Ne next question. <laughs> Sorry. Can a person make a good guess with explicit details about the future that comes true eventually and not be divinely inspired? Oh, I think this question is from Craig Nightwolf. He's asking, so let's say Jesus actually predicted the destruction of the temple, for example. I think his question is, well, couldn't anyone who's just a human being make a prediction like that because maybe the writing was on the wall? Mm -hmm. I mean, anyone could. It is interesting that that prophecy came true. And, it, you know, prophecy was obviously given decades before the temple was destroyed. Um, but, uh, could, I mean, everybody's got to assess that on their own. I would say it's, it's possible. It's just probably fulfilled prophecies, maybe a little bit better of an explanation. Could be wishful thinking, right? Because huh? the temple had been destroyed before once. <laughs> well, yeah, but now you're under uh, Roman rule, and the I mean the idea of being attacked, and you know, because Herod commissioned this, and Herod was in cohorts with with Rome, and it was it was a very secure thing. You would not expect the temple to be destroyed. That that is a risky prediction for sure. Uh, okay. Question for from Brent Kalar. How would you quantify the probability of your hypotheses on the one hand on, and your opponents? So in other words, Camille, your hypothesis of the cloud, Jesus in the clouds, one in what? Uh, I think, yeah, that's a good question. I think it's extremely low. I think it's definitely much uh, more probably false than true. Um, so which means you shouldn't believe it, right? You should believe things that are more probably true than false. Uh, I just think that it's uh, at least as probable as the resurrection. Okay. How about you, Camille? I mean, uh, Blake? Yeah, let me take this opportunity to say that even though Camille and I use use numbers and say 0001, I think we're, we're both in agreement that the ability to pick out a specific number is terrible, usually. Um, what as Bayesians, what Camille and I are, are advocating is basically more of a mathematical representation of inference to the best explanation. Instead of saying, uh, talking about plausibility, we talk about prior probability. It's the same thing. Um, and so if we sound fancy, we're not. You could learn the same stuff in, in 10 minutes if we had time to explain it. We just like the language because it's more precise. And I don't claim to except in very special situations being able to have a specific number. We just we just say way less probable 
than this usually. And, you know, there are several zeros. It's very unlikely. Um, so in terms of specific numbers, I couldn't, I couldn't give one to you, to be honest. I, I wish but, I could. But you think it's more probably true than false, right? You don't think it's like, a, because it, there could be, the, like, it's very often the case that we have just so many different hypotheses and they e partition the probability space so that uh, neither of them is more probably true than false, right? But presumably, you don't think this is the case. You probably think that the resurrection of hy hypothesis is more probably true than false, and it's every other hypothesis takes up only a very small proportion oh, of the probability are we space. About right? Prior probability? Or are we talking about no the, the posterior? Oh, the posterior. Okay, um, I'm much better than that because that's that's more okay. I would say the posterior is like. Well, I mean, 90, higher than 0.99. I'm pretty confident in it, actually. Cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, my, my take on that is that there is like so many different hypotheses that uh, neither of them is pro has the posterior greater than 50%. Like, they are all more probably false than true. It's just that the resurrection hypothesis is just one of them. So the disjunction of every other hypothesis is like overwhelmingly, like overwhelmingly high, right? Uh, and I'm just defending one of the probably hundreds of different hypotheses that you can come up with. Uh, Here's another question. Let's get off the math. <laughs> for, for Blake, yeah. yeah, this one's definitely off of math. So this will be good. How, uh, for Blake, how much of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit affects how one sees the explanatory power and scope of the resurrection hypothesis? You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't think um, I don't think the Holy Spirit's required um, to see it. Uh, but yeah, that's that's interesting. I I have honestly no idea. I know one one hypothesis about the Holy Spirit's interaction with people is that the Holy Spirit helps cloud. Uh, uncloud bad thinking so if someone is thinking poorly one way that the holy spirit interacts is hoping to clear clear thinking in this case if, if the person encountered good evidence um it would help them see that better but long story short i have no idea that's a really interesting question would you expect if the evidence for the resurrection is high or it has explanatory scope and power would you expect a professional historian to go from not being a Christian completely to being a, a Christian, would you expect to see that from professional historians? If they're, if they came to believe that God existed with some confidence, um, and that Jesus is a real, I mean, all historians believe Jesus is a real historical figure that are working and have the relevant background. Um, all teaching professors believe Jesus is a real historical figure. Um, and finally, the thing that Camille and I talked about is a really big neglected question is how plausible is it that God would raise Jesus? I think this is the stickler for a lot of people um, and because look around, how many people does God raise from the dead? And some, a lot of people, even uh, biblical experts who believe in God, um, they're, they're, they're not willing to posit a miracle in this case because they, they might think that Jesus isn't relevantly different from other people. And I would have to spend time with them introducing a lot of a lot of philosophy and a lot of stuff that maybe they hadn't encountered. But before do you think there to... do you think there are professional historians out there who know more than you do? So you don't mm -hmm. have to spend any time with them because they, they could teach you. They mm -hmm. look they've they're not Christian. They have honestly, reasonably, humbly looked at the evidence for the erection and concluded, no, this is not more pro likely than not. There, oh yeah, there's t there's tons of on. I mean, in fact, I assume all of them are are honest, but I think that they have bad philosophy that is causing the resurrection hypothesis to have s to be so implausible to have a low prior but probability. But all of them, all of them. That great, yes, yes. That if phenomenal evidence even isn't going to help them because they think the hypothesis is absurd. It's like trying to convince someone that you know, even if you had good evidence that their next door neighbor flew up in the sky in circles and spit fireballs. I mean, even really good evidence, powerful evidence, is, may not be enough to convince someone that that, that happened. Same because, thing. Because it's absurd? No, not because it's absurd, but because the person believes it's absurd. Right, okay. Something, yeah, so, house is absurd. In this case, their historical credentials won't help them 
assess the likelihood that God would raise Jesus from the dead? What would? This is a philosophy question. What would convince them? A, a, a good philosophical discussion about yes. about whether God exists and what, what God's intentions would be, the, re, the relevance of, of Jesus to God's plan for, um, or God's uh, plausible plan for the world. Why would it be, like there's been many good philosophical discussions on this planet about Jesus and the resurrection. They're from people who are honestly seeking the truth, who are reasonable, rational, all these great things. Why do you think they've had these great, deep, in-depth philosophical discussions and still don't believe it? I think there is a, a good correlation between studying both the history and the philosophy and accepting the truth of the resurrection. I think there's a strong correlation there. Well, um, if, in terms of why, uh, why you rational people end up disagreeing, look at our best um, scientific theories. Um, they can come across the same information. People's background knowledge is finicky, and, and usually if they spend enough time together, they can help uh, converge on their belief. But usually you just have to spend time and iron out those those details and spend time working out the debate. And my assumption would be that that I, I do think that I for most any um, historian, non-Christian historian who doesn't believe in the resurrection, I think and I don't want to sound arrogant, but I think that I would have really important um, things to say that could help at least modify those numbers for them. Can you think of well, a, a non-Christian professional historian who converted to Christianity specifically because of the historical evidence for the resurrection? Sorry? Can, can you think of a, a non-Christian professional historian who converted to Christianity specifically because of the well, arguments well, for the resurrection you know, of Jesus? converted to Christianity, but believes that Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, um, Giza Vermes, who I quoted earlier today, is a Jewish uh, scholar. And he published a whole book on his research finding. The guy remains a Jew. He, I think he's passed. He's passed away now. He's dead um, from not long ago. But he remained a Jew, and he came to believe that God did raise Jesus from the dead, but he still rejected Christianity at the end. But he said that because the evidence was so powerful. Geza Vermes? Mm -hmm. Wasn't he a Catholic priest? Um, or, oh, I may be mistaking him with Pincus Lapid. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he's that's not he's not a historian though, right? <laughs> he wasn't well, a historian. He's a historian. No, I think he's a, a philosopher or a theologian. No, um, he. Well, if you get a theology degree, that I went to Moody Bible Institute. A theology degree and a biblical studies degree are are go hand in hand. They have almost all the same classes, just with a few differences. So. Lapine, well, knew, I think knew, I, he was an expert. Sorry, he was. Yeah, I think. An yeah, I think. I think uh, the big issue, and again, this is something that Mike Lacona very correctly points out, is that he says that a vast majority of New Testament scholars don't actually have any formal training on how to investigate the past, and he, for example, found out that virtually no institution offering higher education in biblical studies, even including the Ivy League ones, uh, offers any courses on how to investigate the past. Uh, he found one exception on the Ivy League level, uh, which I find extremely concerning, because if you go to ancient history and classics in general, you know, like investigating uh, classical uh, history outside the, the Bible, then you find out that the most important thing is actually teaching his, uh, the methodology, right? Apart from the, the languages. Uh, so I, I think I agree with him that this is the key difference in qualification between biblical studies and history in general. Um, this is why there are so so few Bayesians, for example. Just, among, uh, just so you know, ironically, and you've heard, you've heard Craig's debates, you've heard this pointed out before, and it is a fact. Um, people who are specialists in the classics who study history um, in that domain are actually far less skeptical of the documents than New Testament historians are. There are historical sociological reasons for why New Testament scholars have been especially skeptical of the historicity of the text. And it's only been recently in the new quests for the historical Jesus. We're on the third quest, um, moving to the fourth. 
so-called quest of the historical Jesus that they've been coming back to how classicists are doing it. Yet in the meantime, you have to understand that if a classicist picks up a book by a New Testament historian, there the argumentation is the exact same as the, what the classicist would would use. The type of argumentation is the same. Uh, so that because this isn't like some when you say historical methodology, everybody uses the same historical methodology. The same types of arguments are in all fields. It's not, I mean, everybody recognizes an ar a, a good argument. Um, uh, the kinds that you and I have been talking about today, people can hear and they can understand it just fine. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that like, if it's the case that New Testament scholars are just so much more skeptical than the classical historians, why is it that there are so many Christians among New Testament scholars, right? Well, so it's probably those, because the evidence is so good. Those Christians are, would come to the text with skepticism, even if, because you can believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and still be skeptical about the sources being. Um, you can you can be skeptical about how accurate all the details are, as you mm -hmm. mentioned before. You've got the so-called minimal facts type argumentation, so you can agree on some core features while still thinking the texts are generally unreliable. That day is gone. Um, nowadays, they recognize the text as Greco-Roman biographies. Um, they lament the you know the the period before when when this, you know, under Rudolf Boltman on these guys, that, that, that they tried to get away from that. They tried to theolo theologize the text. Um, but no, no, I mean, nowadays, it, I mean, Greco-Roman biographies through and through. I was listening to uh, Tyler Vela the other day and also Ben, oh, it starts with a, some uh, Christian philosopher. And they both, I think, admitted that it, it was their belief the reason why they believe is in two parts. One is them, the vertical relationship they have through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the other was things like philosophy and history. And that's why the question I asked you earlier about how much of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit affects how one sees the evidence. That was my mm -hmm. question. And I, think, oh. and I think that there's a lot of Christians who will watch this now or on the replay who are going to agree with what I'm about to say. That, it's, that they'll disagree with you. It's not about having the proper philosophy. It's not about being a good historian. It's about having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If this is true, if Christianity is true, everything relies on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to regenerate how you even see the evidence, how you even get a good philosophy, because it's the Holy Spirit that guides and leads to all truth. And there's probably a lot of very conservative Baptists listening right now saying amen to that atheist Pine Creek. Um, and so this is why I think even if Christianity is true, are you just spinning your wheels here, Blake? Because the Christians who are saying that are saying that because um, the biblical texts say that the Holy Spirit plays a role in conversion. But when you actually get down to the not, psychology of why people convert, and you you ask and you you ask directly what caused the conversion, even though they'll religiously attribute it to the Spirit, they've got reasons. They're going and they'll list the reasons. Well, yes, they'll list them, but this, a lot of these times, these are not the, re the reasons why they believe it. And uh, like for Michael Lacona, for example, he'll often, and without um, shame, he'll, he'll mention things like the floating garbage can lid, the twirling of the towel that his sister told him he saw, things like this. And then he's thinking, wow, there's a spiritual, there's a uh, supernatural realm. And this mm -hmm. leads him to think the higher probability of Jesus, of a supernatural realm existing. Therefore, there's a God that could have raised Jesus and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm thinking that is what you're doing and what a Christian apologist is doing, is it, is it really that they believe that the evidence is stronger or is it a way to build confidence in themselves? Uh, you know what? Pe people are psychologically interesting. Um, and you're, you're going to have to attack that on a case by case basis. Um, I have no doubt that there are Christians, probably even Christian apologists who have a kind of malignant psychology that results in the beliefs that they have. I do not think that that's the norm. I, um, I can speak to myself and, and like anybody like you, I would say, I don't think I'm, I'm doing things inappropriately. I think I'm going carefully and well, no, I'm not saying that you're doing anything inappropriately, but as far as you know what you do for a living but what mm -hmm. i'm saying is like if we were to go back in time and really examine your life and it's so complicated of what causes what um mm -hmm. like 
Would you predict that you would be any different than a professional historian who looks at the evidence of Jesus Christ but, but has never been a Christian, doesn't even know people who are Christian, but they just don't accept it? Or the philosopher, the atheist philosopher who delves deep into the philosophy of all of the, the supernatural and the natural and all that, but still doesn't buy Christianity. Um, like, I know for me, this, uh, the, the, what I'm asking is about the question of biases, and we all have them. And, like, how do you personally lower your biases and say, well, wait a minute, I should expect a correlation between deep philosophy and people believing in Christianity, but we don't see that, do we? Oh, I think we do. You think there are more Christian philosophers than non-Christian? Sorry? Do you think there are more Christian philosophers with PhD in philosophy than non-Christian? Among philosophers who study the debate over God's existence, this, it's got a weird name. The branch is called philosophy of religion. It's a stupid name because they don't study religion. They study God and God's properties, God's existence and God's properties. And yeah, there's a strong correlation between studying okay, philosophy. I hear you, but if we were to take all the philosophers, PhDs, credentialed, who are not philosophers of religion, and we pay them a million dollars to do nothing but, but to study the God and re the resurrection and so forth mm -hmm. for two years. Re recapitulate what current philosophers of religion have gone through. And I think that there would be a, a definite movement uh, towards theism. Philosophy is very specialized nowadays. Yeah, and both history, both in history and philosophy. Uh, I think people who don't, um, haven't, haven't jumped into that area of specialization are shocked when they get into that area of how good the evidence is, uh, both philosophy and history. Yeah. Maybe if they had a Christian I've, spouse, I'd believe you. I've got, I just heard my wife, she's arrived. Okay. Uh, she's been getting treatment for a, for something. I got to okay. tend to her. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming on, Blake. I really do. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. And let me just say, Camille, um, like, uh, I love what you're doing, man. And I really appreciate it. And we need to be talking more. Um, and I love, yeah. your I love, I love that y'all have analyzed this stuff and think about it together. Um, it's really good. And thanks for having me on. Okay. See you, Blake. Thank you. Take care. Okay. So any questions for me? No, I don't think that we're <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> See, really, I was kind of expecting that people would, uh, try to poke holes in it, uh, maybe even just for fun. Uh, there maybe was questions for you, but uh, I didn't catch it. But so I mean, if anyone has a question, we have 160 people watching. Yeah. We didn't even get to talk about the testimony of women and how it's got them unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think? What did I think? I think for for most Christians watching, um, it was an interesting conversation, if I put myself in their shoes, but um, what you said is not going to impact them one bit. I think for the non-Christians listening, what Blake said is not going to impact them one bit. So it's one of those issues, you know, what com typically happens. Um, I think, like... When when you and and Blake started getting deep into the the discussion, the numbers dropped of how many people were watching. I was watching that. It was started. I think at at the peak there was like 180 some people, and then when you guys started getting into the depths of it, people said, uh, "This is just a story. Enough already." And then they leave, sort of thing. Yeah, and maybe it was probably because it uh, the video at that point was too long. Um, yeah, I mean. I agree that I don't expect to convince a lot of people, but if I get the conversation to a point when the Christian says, I think that the prior probability of the literary devices of Greco-Roman biography being used in this extent is lower than the prior probability of the resurrection, that's fine for me. Because at some point, it's going to be obvious that these are just two completely subjective opinions, and yet you cannot support any other arguments that will move it in either direction, right? This is fine. Like, I, I, at, some, at, at some level, I'm just basically okay in undermining, with undermining the confidence 
in the probability estimate, right? Um, because if the Christian agrees, yeah, we are just seeing the, the same thing differently, then I think that's already a win. Yeah. Was there a certain part where you thought you were the strongest in the discussion? I would probably have to rewatch it. Um, but I really like how I'm deploying Lacuna and Keener against these kind of guys, because they are, of course, extremely conservative historians, right, or scholars. So I, I'm having fun with that. Um, Otherwise, I'm not sure. I like I anticipated a lot of the stuff that he, uh, he he said. I thought he's going to say something like that, um, and I think a lot of the objections are really weak sauce, right? At some like on one hand, it's yellow brick road apologetics because he's basically attacking with things that I like. My hypothesis can explain as basically not being historical. So, like on my hypothesis, the objection doesn't stand because the data um, that the hypothesis that the objection is built on, I think, doesn't exist. Uh, and then it's just speculative, right? Like we have no idea what was actually going on in Jerusalem, like week after Jesus's crucifixion. And if someone tells you that he knows, he probably wants your money. <laughs> you should be really careful about that. Um, yeah, and, like, I mean, and some of the things that he said, I think, is just completely, completely, in, like factually incorrect. Like, if you're a Christian who came late and is listening right now, I, I think if you watch the first hour where I was questioning Camille on his hypothesis, I think you're going to resonate more with how I talked to Camille than what how Blake did it. I really do think so because I just basically kept repeating what Camille was saying and saying, but it doesn't explain this, but it doesn't explain that. And it's very simple. And I think this is how a lot of Christians would actually talk to Camille out, out on the street. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's probably inside baseball, right? Because we both know so much about it, to be humble, that we are going to go after very specific points. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, and then it gets complicated and, and um, esoteric right away. Yeah, it's very, yeah, it's very technical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I, you pro I don't know, did you like what I said there at the end? Because I... I honestly think even like what I said was scientific, the science is behind that, that this is, this is an issue of bias. And we would expect if the resurrection hypothesis had more explanatory power and scope, given all the evidence, that people who had nothing to do with Christianity became a professional historian would look at and say, oh, I'm a Christian now. Or even people, yeah, I mean, or even people who are professional philosophers, not in religion, but philosophy in other areas, spend a year or two looking at the philosophy of uh, religion or whatever, do they become Christians? I don't think so. Yeah, I think I think it's probably generally true that like the more probable a hypothesis is, the more likely it is that people will actually believe it, right? Yeah. So that's definitely true. Um, yeah, there is one thing I have to say that I was very surprised about because I predicted uh, incorrectly, that we are going to spend most of the time talking about the evidence. Uh, and I actually wanted to uh, push kind of Blake into talking about prior probability, because I think that's the biggest weakness of the resurrection hypothesis, that it's just inherently very improbable. improbable. Uh, and that's why I started by asking him if what I'm saying just happened to be the case, would it explain the evidence? And I basically predicted that I will have to push him into agreeing with that, because then we can move to the prior probability. And he went to the prior probability himself. He actually specifically says that this is what he wants to discuss. Uh, and he conceded very quickly that I'm basically explaining all of the data roughly as well as he is, right? It's not like orders of magnitude different, which is great, because then I think the only thing that they have is basically repeating that my explanation has a very low prior probability for various reasons, right? Which is awesome, because you have to remember that the thing that I'm coming up against 
is the resurrection hypothesis, which, as I think, which which I think is like so low that it's floating uh, above uh, Fiji. That's very comfortable. It's not difficult to 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 um, argue against this. So right? what, like, what you're saying is that even though your uh, the probability of your hypothesis is very 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 low, theirs is just a little bit higher, but not much. In their well, minds, I think it's. I, I, yeah, yeah, like um, I, what, whatever they say about like how improbable it is that the the body would not be produced, how improbable it is that Paul would have delusions because of his grief and stuff like that. I can just say, yeah, it's pretty improbable, but it's more probable than a resurrection, right? And then uh, the way how you go about it is arguing that the the resurrection has a very high prior probability, which I think is the weakest point of this whole thing, which is what we saw the last time, right? Like yeah. the best argument for thinking that the prior probability is high is basically saying that Jesus was a celebrity. Yeah, Jesus was a celebrity. He was in a, a what? how did Braxton Hunter put it? A religious theater, a religious uh, context. And um... Yeah, which, which, which makes me doubt it even more. Because it makes me, it makes it more likely that people just became mistakenly convinced of something that they were already predisposed to believe. Like if someone from Denmark then tells me someone was resurrected, I'm more likely to believe it than if it's someone from Ghana or Uganda. You know. Yeah, and uh, John Loftus posted something the other day about apologetics and its growth, and and I um. I would expect that over the last 10 years, the number of apologetic books and conferences and videos and YouTube channels and so forth has grown a lot in the last 10 years, but it doesn't seem to help the fall and decline of Christianity. Or, but they might say, well, it would have been way worse if it wasn't for the apologetics. <laughs> yeah, and also I'm predicting that by the end of the century there is going to be a massive resurgence of Christianity, and it will be it will become extremely popular again because of climate change, because that's going to like screw people so many people over so badly that they will just have to be desperate turn to religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's like I, I think we are basically now living in the golden age it's never going to be as good as it is now in terms of like how few people uh, believe these kinds of things I unfortunately yeah i disagree with you there uh, i think we're progressing but maybe i'm just a silly optimist <laughs> well we should probably get going uh, let me start the music turn down the volume and let's pretend nobody can hear us and it's just me and you, Camille. <laughs> and get ourselves in trouble. Oh, C Cam has just uh, texted me and said I, he can't come on, but he wish he could. Uh, I do think that uh, a lot of uh, conservative Christians watching are going to agree with me that that what Blake is doing is good, but for Christianity, but this is not the real issue. It's their eyes have been scaled over. They're blinded to the truth because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. They're under the power of the evil one. Christians don't like it when I bring this up because they know, they know I'm right and they believe this stuff. And they know that their own scriptures say the gospel is foolishness, yet they're trying to make it look like it has explanatory power and scope, but it's foolishness to those who are perishing. Uh, and, and as I said that, I read your t-shirt. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> Poof. Poof. You're welcome, Brett. Brent. Thanks, guys, for hanging out today. I just want to make sure we get over three hours. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> We're very close.
It'd be great if Camille could do another session with Blake to red pill him on the unreliable of the Book of Acts. Noted. I agree with you, Raphael. But if Camille and I lived in the days of Noah, this is what would happen to us. <laughs> <laughs> 